fellow space fans, and welcome to Professor Britton's Wacky Universe. You're muted. Oh, you're muted. Hey, space fans. I hope I, I hope the intro wasn't muted. I put a, I put a lot of work into that. <laughs> that was cool. Okay. That was good. <laughs> um, all right. So welcome to Astronomy 1020, the online edition. Uh, it's nice for you guys to all be here and sharing your faces with me. Hopefully, we'll get a couple more folks from the class to join us. I think we have. Um, uh, let me take a quick look here at our users. I think we have a full 14 list roster, so it looks like I got about half of you here. I guess that'll be good enough. I just hope the other people got the memo. I suppose you all got the email last night. That's how you knew what to do, right? Okay. Um, in a few moments, we're going to start by going over some basics on the course. Anyone who wasn't logged in when I first started yapping a few moments ago, definitely download that syllabus in the schedule off of the Blackboard. or at least call it up on your browser somewhere so we can talk about it. Did everyone find that okay? Or are we confused? Do you know what I'm talking about? All right, I can see some nods. Yeah, okay. Laura, you got that too? Okay. Um, let's start out uh, by uh, loading up a couple of PowerPoints here, or I think maybe I already did. Uh, I'm gonna share the screen with you in a second. And uh, just kind of get my opening lecture going. Another thing that I uh, may have mentioned, but I'll just repeat myself because I do that sometimes, is if I share screen, if you guys want to follow along on the lecture notes, if we go back to Blackboard here, um, I have just a couple of crappy Roman numeral outlines of the things we're going to talk about. The first half hour or so is an introduction to the class. And then we're going to get into doing some astronomy right proper. So if you want to follow the top-down structure, if you click this thing, you should be able to download just a crappy little Roman numeral outline of what we're talking about here. I don't know. It's not extensive notes, but it'll help you a bit. We're going to take some notes on the blackboard, and hopefully you guys are going to follow along there. OK, so while we're sharing the screen, uh, let's go over here and F5 this fudge. Let's uh, open up this thing. Function. Oh. Okay, I think my function lock is on. Well, in any case, sorry, can you guys hear me now? All right, okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I want to ask the class a question. What's the difference between these two things? Now, I know uh, Shay and Laura are supposed to know because they've had Astronomy 1010 with me. So they're enlightened humans. And I want to make sure that I've got a lot of enlightened humans here. So I got to ask you guys, what is the difference between astronomy and astrology in simple words? Um, I don't know. Is that, is it Jose or Josem? Jose. Jose, okay. So Jose, what do you think? Uh, I'd say astronomy is like the study of like the solar system, the planet and stars. And astrology is, oh man, I forgot what astrology was. <laughs> Isn't it like the, I forgot, something about the signs? Yes, exactly. Okay. That's plenty good. You did great, man. Uh, I'd say that uh, that's, a, that's a pretty decent initial summary of it. Astronomy is a study of stars, planets, galaxies. In fact, uh, I want to try to uh, take some notes on this. Um, so, hold on, I'm going to bop back and forth here. I'm still getting used to this system. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with Zoom, wait, hold on. Show of hands, how many people have used Zoom before in their class? I want to know what I'm working with here. Oh, okay, S just about everyone. All right, so then you know that you can flip back and forth at the top between speaker view and gallery view. 
when I'm uh, putting notes on the note board, I suggest that you go to speaker view and then you double click on my little face to give me a big face and that way you'll be able to see my whiteboard. I was kind of fishing around for a better marker here today. Okay, so we're gonna take some notes. We'll have notes on astronomy versus astrology. You know, I, I think the old fashioned note system actually works because it gives you time to parse what I'm saying and it tells you to, to write down what I'm writing down. Some of you may even try to do this course and wing it without the textbook. And in that case, the notes would be uh, obviously extremely important. I'm sorry, I just wanna mirror my, oh no, I can read that fine, okay. So Jose said that astronomy is uh, a study of things like stars, planets, galaxies, Hell, Jose, I guess the whole damn universe falls under the study of astronomy, which is pretty epic if you think about it. That's kind of like the totality of all things. Mm -hmm. um, whereas astrology has something to do with your science. Capricorn, Aquarius, Taurus, you know what I'm talking about? I know you do because you're talking to me about it when I'm out drinking at the bar, okay? I've heard you ask me my sign before. Now listen, uh, Signs refer to actual real constellations, right? How many zodiacal signs are there? How many different types of people are there in the world? 12. 12, yeah. There used to be 12, now there's 13. We'll talk about that. There's Ophiuchus, the 13th zodiac sign. How many constellations are there in the, all right, now this is a question that's going out to my former students from 1010. Laura or Shay, let's see what you've got. Let's get that junk out of the trunk and tell me how many constellations are there total in the nighttime sky? Can you do that? I'm going back. I'm going to get a change of grade for him, taking you guys down a letter, okay? 88 constellations in the entire nighttime sky. This, the celestial sphere, I've got one right up here. Look, if you look out in all directions from Earth, if the sky in every direction is kind of a giant sphere and you look out towards those constellations, the International Astronomical Union recognizes 88 total constellations. Welcome to the class, Alba. Um, so why are these 13? I guess what I'm trying to say, let me get some coffee here. What I'm trying to say, Jose, is the signs are constellations, right? Why do the astrologers only care about those 13? Does anyone know? All right, let's try this a different way. Let's go back to our lecture slides here. Listen guys, um, here's a picture of what I think your everyday astrologer looks like, okay? This is a typical astrologer. This is how they appear, okay? And uh, the message of astrology goes like this. Everything's going to be great. You will be rich, okay? So that's what astrologers look like. <laughs> now, on the other hand, this is what a typical astronomer looks like. They look a little bit different than astrologers. And the message of astronomy goes like this. The world is going to end when the sun enters its red giant face. So you'll notice that the message of astronomy is not quite as uplifting as the message of astrology. That's the first Point that I'd like to make, all right? Now, people tend to get these things confused, but you could alleviate your confusion by reading about them in one of these two magazines. And the magazine over here on the left, you can get that in your local supermarket uh, checkout aisle while you're waiting to check out your frozen peas or whatever. And there's all kinds of things you can learn about in your astrology magazine, like Uranus moves into Pisces, expect the unexpected, all right? On the other hand, if you wanna learn about, uh, you know, some astronomy stuff, you might have to buy a slightly more expensive magazine. That's one thing you're going to notice about the difference between these two things is, you know, you can, you can get an astrology magazine for about $2.50 in the supermarket, but if you want to get a membership to science or nature, one of these peer-reviewed journals, you're going to have to spend a little bit more. A subscription to one of these bad boys might cost you a few hundred dollars a year. And let me tell you, you get what you pay for because the information content here is, is much greater and deeper. 
first of all, if you want to publish something in the magazine like Science or Nature, you can't just write it up. You got to first do something. You got to go out to your telescope. You got to collect some photons. You got to analyze the data, try to construe your theory, make a model. And then before they let you publish it, you have to submit it to a body of enemy professors who are out to get you. And only after they've carefully reviewed your research, looking for any flaw in your methodologies and begrudgingly admitted that the, the research is technically sound, then they let you publish here. Now, I don't know what the threshold for publication is in Dell Horoscope, but I like to imagine that you walk in with a sort of energy crystal on your forehead, okay? And you say, yo, bro, I'm deeply in touch with the stars. And then there's some cigar chomping editor and he goes, I love it. 20 cents a word, your deadline's due Monday. Okay, so that's the threshold for publication if you want to be a horoscope writer, right? Now, it's not quite, as, uh, not quite as intense. Okay, so people get these things confused sometimes, although I was proud of Jose for knowing what astronomy was, but completely forgetting what astrology was. That actually earned you some points, my friend, okay? Um, uh, but people get them confused because they both have to do with, well, constellations and stars. Here's a cartoon depiction of your horoscope. It's a set of 13 constellations, if you include Ophicus. Um, and these constellations are just a small subset of the total constellations that we recognize uh, on the celestial sphere. And I was trying to get the class to think about why astrologers only care about 13 constellations and astro astronomers care about 88 constellations. Alba, we can't see your face, but I can see you have some kind of a nebula thing going on there. Or maybe that's your room. I can't tell. Okay, uh, anyways, what do you think, guys? Why? What's so special about these 13 constellations? Someone's gotta know. Or maybe my 1010 students, the students who've taken my 1010 course, Laura and, Laura and Shay, you're gonna get lots of attention today, because I know you guys, okay? Uh, maybe you can uh, enlighten us. Does anyone know why? So is it like when the stars were in the constellation when you were born, but I don't know where they would go when you're not Wait, born. how could, the stars are always in the constellation, right? Right, right, right. So I don't like, think like Pollux drifts out of Gemini the day after you're born, <laughs> right? So, wait, the, so what's, in the, what's in the constellations? The stars are always fixed there, aren't they? Oh. Yeah. <coughs> what? What is it? Um, I don't know how to like say it. Come on. People are talking to me. Everyone's like, I'm a Sagittarius. I'm a Capricorn. What's your sign? Nobody gives a shit about Volpecula. No one asks me if I'm a Camillo Pardalis, okay? No one asks me if I'm an Ursa Major. Why is that? Is 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 it is is it the time of year when those constellations are the brightest? Um, well, so this is something we're going to be spending our first couple of weeks learning about. My goal is to train you guys to anticipate and have a basic understanding of when certain constellations are overhead. But unlike planets, which do get brighter and dimmer as they drift to and towards from Earth, in a solar system size scale, distances between planets can change rather dramatically. And then a planet like Venus, for instance, can get brighter. But if you ignore Betelgeuse, which freaked out on us uh, last season, um, the stars don't really change their brightnesses. Okay, I'm going to lie to you now because lying to you is easier than telling you the truth. Stars <laughs> don't change their brightnesses because their distances are so much epically farther than planets that they're essentially locked in place. As Earth orbits the sun in one year, that, that small change in distance really doesn't affect the distance to the stars. So I don't know who said that, uh, if you're hiding somewhere, or if that, oh, that was you, Joel. OK. Um, the, the constellations don't change their brightness, but they do change when they're up or when they're down. For instance, uh, I was going to begin my proper astrology, oh my gosh. My proper, oh, my proper astronomy lecture today by showing you a picture of the constellation Orion. Can I get some help from Orion? Here we go. 
Uh, sorry, guys, I'm still fiddling here. Hmm. I, okay. I somehow put on my function lock, but that's actually a good thing. That's gonna help me. Uh, this, this is a constellation known as Orion. And uh, you can see a couple of well-known stars in the configuration here. Here's the great red star Betelgeuse, which underwent a dramatic dimming this spring. These are the three stars that make up the belt. He's kind of like a hunter constellation. These are his shoulders. He's got some legs. This is the great blue star Rigel. He's got another leg over here. These three stars we're gonna talk about, they're called the sword of Orion. They dangle down. Sometimes he has a bow in one hand and he's kind of cropped, but he's got an arm that extends up here. So the constellation of Orion can be seen throughout the late uh, fall and winter time. January, February is a great time to see it. Right about now, you probably cannot see Orion in your sky. It's not up. So Joel, that was a long-winded way of me saying constellations are not changing their brightnesses, but there are different times of the year at which they are up. However, this still doesn't address the issue of astrology. Let's Is write that one? down. Let's take it as a note. Since no one knows, I'm going to tell you. Oh, you guys are making use of the chat log. Okay, Alba, that's fine. You can just do your thing. We're glad you're here. Okay. Um, is, it, is it when the sun is with the... That's constellation? right. It's, oh, wow. it's okay, fine. So you do remember, Laura, it's when the sun is located in those constellations. Those, the sun drifts against those constellations. Let's quickly, before we take notes, let's look at slide 51 together. Uh, let's try that again. 51. Nope. <clears throat> okay. Hold on, guys. Uh, it was 51 in yesterday's class. Why isn't it 51 today? Hold on a second. I want this picture, slide 58. Let's try that again, F5, 58. Okay, during the course of the year, you guys can see my screen, correct? You can see what's going on here? Earth is orbiting around the sun in an almost circular orbit. In that circle, its orientation in space remains fixed. So during the course of the year, as Earth drifts around the ecliptic, um, we can see the sun projected at different times against different constellations. Now in March, you will not see the constellation Pisces because it will be up during the day. But guess which constellation you will be able to see uh, in March? That, uh, annotate. Sorry, things are moving slow on my computer here. You'll be able to see Virgo, because Virgo will be up high in your sky at midnight. Virgo won't be any brighter than it normally is, but it will be up at the darkest part of the night, so you'll definitely notice it more. And this is the basic idea behind astrology with a, a little extra twist. So let's take some notes on this. Speaker view, okay. The central premise of astrology you guys can read this, correct? Joel, give me a thumbs up. Okay, good. The premise is that the location of the sun against the background stars and here comes the real kicker. The location of the sun against the background stars on your B-Day, that's of course your birthday, will uh, determine your personality type and uh, or your destiny. So that's the idea behind astrology. That's what makes it different than astronomy. It operates under the premise that the constellation that the sun is in against the background stars on your B-Day determines your personality type. And this is why astrologers are interested in 13 particular constellations. Those are the 13 constellations that the sun can be found in. The sun will never appear in Orion. That does not happen because of the orientation of the solar system. Now, astronomy back over here is, is 
it's a couple of different things. It's a science. That's what you've signed up to learn about from me. Um, sometimes people call it a physical science. It has aspects of a physical science. It's also uh, has aspects of a natural science. And these things used to be debated a little bit more by philosophers, but the, the distinction is subtle. Physical sciences are sciences in which you can manipulate and touch your environment. If a physicist builds a lever or a particle accelerator, or if a chemist puts some goo in an Erlenmeyer flask and sets it on fire, that's like a physical science. You're manipulating and measuring your thing. Whereas like a natural science is one where you can't touch the thing uh, like geology, where you count the number of mountains or islands in a chain, or you're, maybe you're uh, Charles Darwin and you count how many sea turtles are on the Galapagos Islands. That's kind of like a natural science. Astronomy used to be a natural science because we couldn't touch the stars. We could only count them and observe them from afar. But today, of course, we build rovers that traverse the, the sands of Mars and drill into the soil and collect samples. So it has very much aspects of a physical science. It's kind of like physics for space, right? Yeah. But sciences are different than other things like philosophy or religion. Philosophy is interested in truth. M metaphysics and religion have to do with the intangible universe. Where does your soul go where you die? Or, you know, is it moral if I strangle my neighbor's dog because it was barking too much? These are questions your rabbi or your guru needs to answer. But astrology isn't really like that either because all of the things that it talks about in this premise are part of what we call the physical universe. The universe that is capable of being groped, manipulated, set on fire, tasted and touched and smelled, right? Like the sun. The sun is a physical object. And if you've ever heard of the Parker Solar Probe, let's share screen. Let's, I think I already have it logged up here somewhere. Uh, the Parker Solar Probe is the latest in um, space exploration having to do with the sun. It's a spacecraft that's been designed to travel through the outer layers of the sun's atmosphere. And it's currently on a set of um, parabolic, or, uh, sorry, elliptical orbits that's going to take it closer and closer to the sun. And when the spacecraft travels through the outer envelope of the sun, it's actually going to capture particles of solar plasma to analyze them. So that's kind of cool. That means we've actually reached out and sort of touched the sun with our mechanical fingers. That's a very exciting uh, experiment there. So the sun is clearly a physical uh, object capable of being investigated. And the stars, we, we haven't figured out how to get to them yet, but we can certainly collect photons from stars and analyze their compositions. We know what stars are made of. Your B-Day is kind of like a historical fact. That's on your driver's license. And then you get into things like personality types, right? Personality types are a little bit difficult to measure, but psychologists claim they can do this by, you know, giving you questionnaires or whatever. And so the point that I'm trying to make is, mm -hmm. it is possible to go out as a curious person and investigate the statement. You can go and you can measure a person's personality type with a Miggs Breyer personality test, and you can compare it to your B-Day and where the sun was. And what you'll discover if you go out and measure people's personalities and check their destinies against their birthday is that this statement here is a false statement. It is not true. And uh, I hate to tell you, but if you were born on Albert Einstein's birthday, that don't make you freaking Einstein, okay? You're not, you're not going to be Albert Einstein just because you were born on his birthday. And uh, if, he, if he used to, you know, harass his wife, you're not going to be a woman harasser because you were born on Albert Einstein's birthday either, okay? So, so that's, that's just not how it works. And if you go out and conduct this study yourself, and many people have, you discover that there's absolutely no relationship between a person's personality type or their destiny uh, based on where the sun was in the background birthday. And one of the obvious ways is because if this were true, there would only be 12 or 13 types of people in the world. And anyone with even more than a casual or limited experience of humans knows that that is just so not true. 
And of course, they got to mix it up a little bit. If it was just 13 types of people, that would get pretty boring, right? Or totally unbelievable. So what they do is they add some extra stuff in there, plus the planets, you know? Okay, so we're both a crapper corn, but guess what? Uh, it turns out that uh, Uranus was in my rising house of Leo, so that means you're a big jerk. And by the way, you owe me 20 bucks. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know how this works. Uh, <laughs> in any case, because... Because the premise of astrology does not hold up under self-scrutiny, because they're basically just making shit up that isn't true, philosophers have dubbed astrology as a pseudoscience. Uh, I want to put this in some dramatic color to really drive my point home. It's a pseudoscience. And the pseudoscience makes claims using technical garbly gook language that sounds like science. They throw in some planets and some star charts and things. But then if you actually go out and investigate their statements, they do not bear up under scrutiny. So it's, it's you know, it's like snake oil salesman stuff. Uh, so there's that, right? There's, there's astrology. Let's get back to my show here. Um, F5. F, ooh, sorry guys, F5, and I don't remember what the number was anymore. So uh, this on the other hand is a picture of what, what's happening up in outer space. This is the kind of stuff that astronomers spend their time thinking about. Um, how many of you know what this picture is? Any space fans out there that recognize this iconic image from outer space? No? Well, I guess you're gonna get your money's worth this semester. You're looking at the Horsehead Nebula, okay? This is uh, so named for its uh, seahorsey shaped cloud of hydrogen gas. This is what the real universe is up to, kids. Like, this is 99.999% of the universe are cold clouds of dirty hydrogen gas and hot ionized plasma and giant spheres of gas that are radiating light. Doesn't really have anything to do with toilet paper or how much Windex is on the shelf or any of those daily quotidian concerns that, uh, that are, are, are so important to us. The real universe is weird. It's much weirder than even you. And that means we should probably look out and find out what's going on inside of it uh, because it's beautiful and creepy and cool. And I want to know what all this stuff is. In fact, I'm going to teach you what I know about this stuff. So whatever you plan on learning this semester, let's start by learning one essential thing. Astronomy does not equal astrology. They're not the same thing. And it seems like some of you guys already knew that. Um, and with that, welcome to our class. You are signed up to take Astronomy 1020, a course that specializes in studying stars and galaxies. Uh, how many people know what this picture is? Oh, Evelyn, do you know? Oh. Isn't it just the Milky Way? Uh, no, we believe our own galaxy looks Evelyn. similar to this. But this is, Shay, do you know? Andromeda? Oh, who said that? Where are you? I heard oh, you. Oh, that was, that was me again. Oh, oh, that was you, Evelyn. Uh, when I'm sharing my screen, I can only see four or five of you at a time. So I kind of, oh. I zoom back and forth and I can miss you. Okay, Evelyn, <laughs> yes, this is Andromeda. Well done, well done. Um, and Andromeda is our sister galaxy. I'm gonna spend some time talking about that. Okay, so I'm your host, Brendan Britton. Uh, I've been teaching this class a long time. I'm a, a associate professor here at CCRI. Here's an action shot of me, courtesy of the CCRI marketing department. Thank you very much for making me look like a dweeb. Um, more importantly, it's a nice picture to start off with because you can see the CCRI telescope, our 16-inch uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope, which is in the Margaret Jacoby Observatory in the uh, woods in front of CCRI. Sadly, I will probably totally not get to take you out to this telescope and let you look through it because we are all under sort of um, restricted uh, socialization these days. But I, I open it to the public every Wednesday when things are normal. So maybe if by the end of class, if the powers that be decide that we're capable of interacting again, uh, I could take you guys out and let you look through this thing. It's, it's really nice. And on the public open nights, you can come by with your dad or your kid brother, whoever you want to bring. And it's a pretty chill experience. You just kind of show up and I say, hey, what's up? Do you want to see some stuff? Do you want to see Andromeda? Do you want to see 
a planet or a galaxy. And it's a, it's a nice, free, fun thing to do with friends. So, okay, enough about me. Who are you? Well, I only know Shay and Laura because they took my 1010 class. And I'm getting to know the rest of you because I have – this is actually better than being in person because you've got little floating names next to your faces. So I'm, I'm thinking this is going to – I'm going to remember your names even better than I uh, typically do, which is not very well. But whoever you are, I'm glad that you signed up for my online class. And I hope that you come here every Tuesday and Thursday with the following two things. First thing you're going to need is a calculator. I'm going to tell you exactly which model I want you to buy. And you're also going to need a positive attitude because these uh, summer classes are quite long and you're basically gonna be spending your whole Tuesday and Thursday with me. And you signed up to do that. You paid $500 to listen to me talk about seahorsey shaped clouds of hydrogen gas. Thank you very much for your patronage. I am enjoying this deal, okay? Now I'm gonna be here every day and I'm gonna try to have fun and make it fun as I can. I'm gonna try to teach you stuff. But if the lecture gets long and it gets tiring, well, that's just the nature of lectures. So try to get into it and try to have a good time. And I think we'll all, uh, we'll all have a better experience for it. One of the first things that you already have done right is by, sh uh, I know not everyone can share their uh, camera, but by letting me look at your faces, it makes this a little more interactive. And I, I do appreciate that. Okay, so uh, what's up? We're here, uh, let's click ahead here. We're here to study the universe. And I would propose to y'all that the universe is a cool place to be and something that you'd want to, to learn about. Um, we've got things like stars. Obviously, for Laura and Shay, it would be nice if we could start off with stars on day one. But the rest of these guys need a little bit of physics training and a little background in space and numbers before we can do that. So we'll probably get to stars about halfway through the course, I, uh, honestly. Uh, I we're need a study refresher anyway. <laughs> okay, yeah. The refresher doesn't hurt one bit. Um, in fact, sometimes the second time, that's when it starts to make sense, actually. So I remember when I took French one for the second time in high school. That's what I really started to understand. Comment de parlez-vous, okay? So, all right. So anyways, uh, <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes it's a refresher isn't so bad. Um, uh, we're going to learn about galaxies a little bit. Um, I have a whole bunch of lectures on galaxies that we probably won't get to because it's the end of the class. So I'll try to smatter some galaxies in there. Um, and we're gonna learn about all kinds of cool stuff. In fact, astronomy is the study of the universe, of all the galaxies in all directions that we could imagine studying. And that's a pretty big topic. So we've got a lot to cover here. That's why you're gonna need to make a new best friend. And your new best friend is called math. The reason why we're gonna need some math in this class is twofold. One, this is a physical science class. And as I will demonstrate in our lab today, physical sciences are about measurement. That's what makes science different than other things. They measure things and they report those measurements to their friends. They don't talk nonsense unless they've measured it. They make sure that they have concrete evidence to back up their statements. Okay, so once you start taking measurements and you get some numbers, you get a hankering to do math. Not because you like to torture people, but because you're curious about nature. When you look at the heart of Andromeda and you think, yo, dog, that's so cool. I love all, what is this stuff anyways? I have no idea what I'm looking at. That's why you need to prepare yourself. You have to get the stamina to look at pictures like this. Uh, or if you want to learn about why these cool nebulae are so beautiful, you're going to have to get used to some diagrams like this. You use math as a tool because you're desperate to learn about weird, cool shit in space, okay? And also, it makes you a strong and smart person. You can't be bamboozled by witch doctors and snake oil salesmen who wanna sell you things for $19.99. Um, learning about math is part of the heart of this course. It's one thing that makes it kinda cool. <coughs> Anyways, that's why you're gonna need one of these. This is the official calculator for the course. It is called the Casio FX260 Solar Calculator, available wherever calculators are sold, like T Staples, Best Buy, uh, Walmart has them for eight bucks. That's less than the price of a pack of smokes. You can get yourself a Casio calculator and learn all about the universe, okay? Now, the reason why I want you to all get this calculator is because most of you probably don't know as 
you don't know nothing, okay? And I, I'm just gonna assume you don't know nothing at math. That's usually a good assumption. And I'm gonna show you guys what to do, okay? I'm gonna tell you how to do everything. I'm gonna assume that you're a reasonable person who can at least multiply and divide, or if you're not, I'm gonna assume that you're a reasonable person who can find the multiply and the divide key on your calculator and push those buttons when I say go. And if you push all the buttons I tell you to in the sequence that I tell you to push them, then you too can learn math, okay? But this is gonna be really horrible if you all have some different calculator, I'm not gonna know, oh, well, I like the cat. I can see we've got cat crew here today. All right, so I'm just gonna break the fourth wall for a second. In my last uh, spring where I had to do this online thing for the first time, all of my astronomy 1010 students had cats and they would all have their cats in the little windows during lecture. And all of my astronomy 1020 students had dogs and they would have dogs in the lecture. Now, I taught my 1010 class yesterday and there were like three or four dogs. The fact that we just saw a cat come into the frame here in Will's computer tells me that this is gonna be a cat crew that I'm dealing with. <laughs> so, uh, so show us your cats whenever you got them. Okay, anyways, uh, back to the show. Um, we all need to get this calculator. That's gonna make the instructions much simpler. Hell, Will, even your cat can do math if he learns to hit the buttons in the sequence that I tell them. If everyone has a different calculator, this is gonna be horrible and it's gonna take a long time. Um, now, today I'm gonna start training you on this thing. Believe it or not, I've, I've got my own uh, Casio calculator. I brought mine to class today. And so this is the most important thing for you to get. Um, today, how many, how many of you have some kind of a scientific calculator floating around? Let me see a show of hands here. Oh, awesome. Uh, that, uh, Joel, that's not a bad calculator. That's a nice third choice calculator. I'd say it's a second or third choice calculator, but we'll be able to work with it. Laura, I'm glad that you showed up prepared. Look at Laura's got her Casio FX260 Solar. That's the white edition. It's the solar too, yes. <laughs> also available uh, at calculator stores. Um, the rest of you might wanna try using your phones today. Uh, Android people, there's an app that's almost exactly like the Casio FX260 Solar. I tend to use a crappy little calculator on my iPhone called PCalc Lite. It's free, I think, PCalc Lite. And it's, it's not a great calculator, but could you just find some kind of a calculator to use today? Because we want to start practicing. Uh, but your phone calculator will not be sufficient for the whole course. You're going to eventually need that, that model that I told you about. <clears throat> what if you have like a graphing calculator from high school? Is that Evelyn, like... Hey, oh, Evelyn, I think about this anytime someone asks me that question because, hold on. Uh, wait, wait, Evelyn. Wait for it. I've got mine too. I still have, it's funny, I can never do this when I'm in a real class. I still have my TI-85 from high school. That was a long ass time ago and I'm still rocking this thing here. Now, Evelyn, if you know how to use this thing, then that's fine, okay? But I think the litmus test is this. If I punched a number into your calculator, if I punched 987654321, and I told you, take the fourth root. Do you know how to take the fourth root of that number using your calculator? Not anymore. <laughs> then, then you wanna get the Casio FX260 Solar because um, although this is a wonderful and powerful tool, um, if everyone's got a different one, it'll just take extra time. I, I can walk you through it. I know, I'll, I know how this thing works. I got my own version of it here. Can I tell you something, Evelyn? Over the years, I've learned to like this more than the, uh, the, the, the TI-85s and stuff. You know why? This is like your quick draw sidearm. Like if you're like a cowboy, you just pull it out and you go boop, 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 boop. And uh, these guys, this is kind of like a bazooka, right? And not every problem requires a bazooka. Sometimes you just need a little six shooter at your side to shoot the bad guys. And uh, one of my uh, former students is now uh, an engineer. He was at Worcester Polytech and he said, Brendan, after you trained me on this thing, all these engineers had their TI-85s out and they were like punching through. And I had been trained so well by you that I was going doot, 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 doot and, and out calculating them all. He was, like a, he was like a legend for his little Casio. So Evelyn, I'm saying this, it's only eight bucks, right? The hell, 
Why not? Why not buy it? It's also solar powered. The batteries will ne never die. And symbolically, it's going to be powered by the sun. That seems very appropriate for this class, okay? Anyways, think about it, Evelyn. Meanwhile, get that TI-85 out today, okay? So have that handy today. Uh, okay, um, before we start getting into the astronomy thing, I'm kind of gabbing away here, we should probably talk a little bit about the classroom system so that you guys have a sense of what I expect from you and how your grades determined and all kinds of stuff like that. So uh, let me pull up a stool here because this is gonna be a sitting down kind of operation. And uh, while I'm sharing my screen, let's head on over to the syllabus and you guys can uh, look at it right here on my screen. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, that's slide 26. And if you downloaded the syllabus, oh, hold on guys. Um, there we go. Sorry. When all these different windows are open, it gets a wee bit confusing. Okay, couple of things. Here's the syllabus for the course, and it's got a whole bunch of useful information that you're gonna wanna know. Um, that's me, I'm Brendan Britton. Um, here's my email in case you ever need to email me. I even put my bloody cell phone, since I don't have an office anymore, I put my cell phone up here. If you wanna uh, text me or call me about something, then hell, I guess that's okay if you do it responsibly. If you text me in the middle of the night, I might be buzzed, and I guess that's your fault, not mine, right? So in any case, uh, sometimes, there's a, sometimes there are problems, like someone needs a grade or a thing where it's just easier to shoot a text, and I'm cool with that. Um, I don't have an office anymore. I've got just Zoom. So if you guys ever need a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, I'm happy to Zoom with you, but I'm hoping to do everything right the first time so that we don't uh, have those issues, but we'll see. Um, I've listed the official texts. The Cosmic Perspective is the main book for this course to follow along with. And I had a nice chat with Joel about the three different flavors of the Cosmic Perspective. The full text, the ninth edition, is purple and has a Milky Way picture on it. Um, there's also halfy versions. You can get the stars, galaxies, and cosmology half version. That's fine. Do not get the solar system version. That's for my 1010 course. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying an experiment this semester where <clears throat> I'm trying to provide most of the stuff that you need. You may even be able to get away if you're really careful without getting a book. Now that might be a little bit scary for some of you guys, but I'm gonna sort of provide the questions and do the homeworks with you. So the main reason you would need the book is if you are a person who reads textbooks and uses them to study, Right, but a lot of times, uh, Catherine, we don't even end up doing that. They just collect dust, right? And I've started to realize this. So I will, should have enough, but you better take careful notes and follow along. Uh, in any case, if you do the things that I tell you to do, uh, it might not even matter. So if you wanna try tight roping without a, a net, try not getting the book, see what happens. Um, we'll be able to do our assignments together in any case, but I, I recommend this. The astronomy lab manual, don't bother getting that. I'll give you copies of the pages that we're gonna use and that'll save you all a few bucks there. If you can get a digital version of this or whatever, try it. Hell, you can even steal them sometimes. Not that I would recommend that, but I've heard people do that. In any case, um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, we're gonna talk about your grade. And here I have a little rubric explaining how your grade is partitioned in this class. Oh, I'm sorry. Lastly, but not leastly, we're all going to buy the Casio, right? FX260 Solar Mach 1 or Mach 2. Get that calculator. Okay, um, your grade is determined by four parts. Homework, labs, midterms, and final exams. And let me go over that with you here in my slideshow, if you don't mind. Okay, F5. Slide 26, all right. First thing you discover is that attendance is worth 0% of your grade. And that's because you paid hundreds of dollars to listen to me talk. I like this arrangement, it works for me. And I'm gonna be here every Tuesday and every Thursday talking about space and other things like that. Um, if you'd like to listen, why, you're welcome to do that. Uh, I'm very tolerant. I don't really mind anything that you do as long as it doesn't disrupt the class majorly, 
little minor disruptions are okay. Um, you will have to be here in some sense though, because every day we're gonna be doing a homework and every day we're gonna be doing a lab. So let's talk about the lab first. Lab happens at the end of this class. Oh, I, there's one other thing here. Hold on. Let me drop these books because they're in my lap. Uh, a slight notice about times in this class. The, the division of time is slightly different than it says in the textbook. I'm sorry, in the sign-up page. I'm actually going to run the lecture an extra half an hour, but I'm chopping a half an hour off the lab. I basically traded a half an hour of lab for half an hour of lecture. So it was supposed to run 12 to 2.30 lecture and 2.30 to 4.30 lab. We're going to do 12 to 3 lecture, so a little extra half an hour. Um, and lab is going to run from 3 to 4.30, but actually I'm going to try to cut some corners and I'm going to try to get us out of here every day by 4. That's my goal to help make this less horrible, okay? Occasionally it'll run a little over four, but I'm hoping not so much. Um, so because three hours is a really long time to listen to anyone talk, um, I find it helpful to have a little tea break, okay? So uh, uh, where's my little uh, annotate and where's my text? So somewhere over here we'll have like a little tea break. And usually I like to do that around 1.30 or I think yesterday I did it 1.45 to 2 or sometimes I'll do it 1.30 to 1.45. I don't know, just a little 15 minutes, 20 minutes for us to have a snack and just to stop, just to stop listening to me talk. That's good for all of us. Um, so uh, I'll try to remember that when 1.30 comes around. So I'll finish whatever point I'm making. We'll take a little pause. <clears throat> um, we're also going to have office hours, and this is a key part of the course. Office hours are before class, and uh, I'm going to sort of want all of you to join them, and I'm going to talk about why. Um, we're going to do our labs every day at 3 p.m., and I've provided you with scans of uh, the lab book. So we'll have some exercise to do. And I'm going to be your digital eyes and ears. I have a lot of gear set up here. You'll notice I brought all my toys from CCRI with me, all my cart and stuff. I brought all this gear. And so in a lab, it's supposed to be like a hands-on physical thing where we all do stuff together. We can't do that online, and I can't expect you guys to get all this fancy lab equipment. So I'll be setting up the lab equipment here in my room. And I'll switch on my remote camera from my phone, which I can connect to Zoom, and I'll kind of run the experiment, and you guys will record the numbers. It's a little bit cheesy, but I think that's what we're stuck with, right? I don't know how else I can run a lab course. They wanted me to have you guys buy these kits for $60 where you'd get all this stuff. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to run the lab from my room, and you guys can watch and take down the numbers. Um, and then you'll submit them all by Blackboard by just taking a picture with your cell phone or whatever. <clears throat> Labs are pretty easy and fun. It'll take about an hour. I'll try to have a point. I'll show you some cool optical effects. You'll write down whatever I tell you to write down, and then you submit it, and that's an easy 10 points for you. Do it right at the end of class, okay? Um, that'll keep your grades high. Now, here's the hard part of the course. The hard part of the course is the homework. And that's because every day you're going to have uh, <clears throat> five problems due for me. They're, in a physics class, these would be called problem sets. Five problems from the back of the textbook. Now, um, these problems can be pretty challenging. Sometimes they're word questions that want a paragraph or two. Sometimes they're little math questions that involve formulas. For some of you, this can be real challenging. Um, and first of all, let me start off by saying that uh, because some of you might want to just not even buy the book, if you go into Blackboard here and we go to our homework session, the homework that we'll be doing on Thursday is homework number one. It's five problems from the back of chapter one and chapter two in the textbook. Um, you'll notice that I made scans of those pages to help you. So when it comes time to do the homework, you can click on them. And uh, boom, here's chapter one. So let's see what our first question is. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, chapter one, number 42. So 
This first one, scaling the local group of galaxies. The Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy have a diameter of 100,000 light years. The distance between the two galaxies is 2.5 million light years. Using a scale where one centimeter is 100,000 light years, draw a sketch for both galaxies and some other stuff. Look, some of these questions, obviously you're not gonna know how to do them until I explain them to you. But even after my lectures, you still might find those questions tough to do. And in the old days, I used to run this like a normal class and I used to assign homework and I used to watch people fuck it up and turn in total garbage. And then I would grade it and I would be pissed off and everyone was just upset all the time. And it took a long time to grade those crappy homeworks that had no clue what I wanted, right? And then I realized there's such a better solution for all of us. What if I just do the homework with you? What if we just do it together? Kind of like we do lab, right? I'll show you how to do the problems like a pro. I'll show you what I want. You just kind of follow along and then you turn it in and then you get good grades. You'll learn more. And I trade the time that I would have spent being angry and pissed off at you. I trade that for time spent just hanging out with you, which is way more fun, right? So this as now ask, don't take my word for it. Ask Shay and ask Laura, who've taken a class with me, Office hours are kind of fun. And the, uh, some people have the mistaken idea that I'm asking you to do extra stuff. He wants me to sign in before class. He's making me do all this extra stuff. Wrong. You want to do those homework problems on your own, Haas? Feel free. You got about 24 hours to do it. Feel free to stay up all night working on those problem sets and see how you feel. And then when it didn't go so well, here's what you're going to do. You and me are all going to log in early, we're gonna uh, come to class at, I scheduled the office hours just before class from 10 a.m. to 12. I'm gonna hate doing this because I hate waking up early. I'm a total vampire bat. I don't like to get up before four, okay? But I am somehow gonna get up at 10 a.m. to help you guys do these homework problems and you're gonna sign, you're gonna do it too. And I'll just show you what to do and then your homework will be done perfectly and you don't have to do any work at night or be stressed out at all. You just turn it in right then. Doesn't that sound like a, a better way to do it? Think about it. You will spend longer than, uh, Catherine, what are you thinking? I have to work till 11 on oh. days that I have this class. Is there okay, so, any way? So we could this is an issue, out. right? <clears throat> I, did you notice that when I started this class that I hit the record button? Yes. So that's how it's gonna work. Um, I'm going to record the homework sessions just like I record them. Now, I would recommend that if you can be here, I guess you're probably working from home these days, I would assume. Well, I'm babysitting for my job. And then once my work starts back up, I'll be able to be here. But for the next two weeks, I work babysit from till 11 o'clock. Sure. So that's why I'm going to hit the record button and have them recorded. Okay. So you'll be okay, because what you'll do is, see, it's just gonna kind of suck a little more for you, because rather than doing it together as a group before class, you will watch the recording afterwards. Okay. And, um, and then you'll be able to do it and submit it then. Does that sound good? Yeah. Uh, I put, oh, by the way, I'm gonna record this entire lecture in the lab, and I will record the office hour session too, and I put the videos up to my YouTube every day for situations like yours. Awesome. The one thing I will tell you, Catherine, why eventually when work starts up the normal way, when you can join us, remember, I've done these summer classes many times, and what I discovered is by the end of lecture and by the end of lab, you're kind of like psychically exhausted. So the thought of, you know, it's dinner time and you're getting grumbly and hungry, and then the boyfriends or the girlfriends want to make dinner and watch TV, all the shit that life throws at you you tend to like not be very excited about doing the homework after a whole day of this. That's why I discovered that doing it just the two hours before we do the hardest part first and then we kind of roll down the hill. So you'll have to struggle a little harder, but you must get those homeworks in or this whole class goes to shit. Okay. We're depending okay. on you, Catherine, to not <laughs> screw this up. Okay? I'll try. I'll try. All right. But does everyone understand the value of what I'm saying here? We're just going to do the homework together. And then honestly, yes, there are gonna be two, well, maybe one scary test I'm gonna make you do. And that is gonna be truly terrifying. It's gonna be a big 100 point test. You're gonna get the heebie-jeebies trying to do this thing. But honestly, if you just do all your labs and your homeworks, you can afford to totally do badly on the test and still get a great grade like a A, B, or C in this course. 
you will not fail. You won't even get a D if you do all your homeworks in labs. And basically, I'm going to do them for you. So you just have to tune in and just write down whatever I say, okay? Believe it or not, you actually learn a lot by doing that. And it's just the way it should be. It's not stressful. So, okay. So everyone's making a pledge besides Catherine. We're all going to come in. At, we'll do this at 10 o'clock on Thursday because our first homework assignment is due, correct? Yes. Can you all agree for that? All right. Like I said, if you, if you feel like doing them at night, you can watch the recording like Catherine. If you feel like doing them on your own, you're crazy, but you can try that, all right? But thank God, think about it. All of our work will be done in the day. You won't have to worry about this at all at night. You don't have to take anything home with you. No term papers, no staying up light, taking no dose and Adderall, trying to write your uh, term paper. I'm not gonna do any of that to you. We'll just do all the work together and then it's over, okay? So I think that's... That's a plan for fun and success. Uh, thank God I am not an art teacher, right? I don't have to look at your crappy little sculpture at the end of the semester and say, I don't know, B minus. You know, I don't know how those art teachers do it. Your grade is a number. So let me, uh, am I still on share screen right now? Are you still seeing my screen? Okay, so uh, let's fiddle over here to my PowerPoint slide while I drive the final point home. 50% of your grade uh, comes from a combo of homeworks and labs. And I'm going to do the homeworks and labs with you so you can't screw that up, okay? So labs we do every day, that's good. Homeworks we do every day, that's good. Um, usually one has a midterm and a final, bare minimum in a class. If I like the class, and if you guys are cool to me, and if you do your work, I might be willing to, to not have a final exam. I'll just double your midterm grade, and instead for our last day, I'll teach you about some other cool aspect of space. That will be super low stress, because once we do the final exam, we don't have to take any more tests. I think that's kind of cool for a summer course, because it brings anxiety down, but that means we'll want to try really hard in our midterm, and if anyone really wants to take another 100-point final exam, then I'm happy to you know, oblige you, but I'd say probably just one test will be enough for all of us, right? All right. But like I said, you can actually completely bomb the midterm. And if you do all your homeworks and labs, you'll still get a pretty decent grade in this class. So the only way you could F this thing up is if you just drop out and don't show up. You know what I mean? Like if you're just, if you flake, if you flake, that's when things will go bad. So don't flake, just show up and do the work. And if you have to miss class because an alligator eats your leg off, well then watch the video that night in the hospital room and do the papers and submit them, okay? Because this class is gonna move kind of quick. <clears throat> and and uh, like I said, your grade is, is a number. It's an objective system. I'm gonna apply a slight curve, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna take all the homeworks you did, make that 25% of your grade. I'm gonna take all the labs you did, 25%. And I'll probably just have one exam and that will be 50% of your grade. Okay, uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Because I know you care about the grades and I'm trying to be transparent with you, but I don't know if I was, if I covered it all. Yeah, Evelyn. I just have a question about like uploading stuff because I've never used Blackboard before. So how, how does that work? Great, I wanted to address that because I have never used Blackboard before last semester and it was confusing for me too. Um, it's actually pretty darn simple, and uh, we're, st we're still on share screen, right, Evelyn? Yes. All right. So yeah. um, that's okay. Uh, Evelyn, when I'm in Blackboard, do you see here how it says homework one? Or let's, we're going to be doing our lab today, so let's focus on the lab. So when we do our lab today, I'm going to go to student view, so it looks like you see it, and I would go to my lab tab. And when it's time to submit, you click lab one, and it's pretty darn easy. Um, you just click browse my computer or browse my phone, and you upload an image. Now, normally what students do at the end is they do their work on uh, a printout of the lab papers. So yesterday we did uh, the same lab. And at the end, the students usually will take a cell phone, just take a simple little picture of it, and they'll upload that uh, right to Blackboard. Now. Evelyn, if you have a fancy new iPhone, your default camera settings 
are high resolution and it stores it as a .heic, I cannot read that. I can read JPEGs and I can read PDFs in certain documents. So if you have a fancy iPhone, you're gonna to wanna to go to your settings, your camera settings, and choose format most compatible. And you'll know if you got it right, Evelyn, because when you upload the picture, you're gonna see a little preview of it in the window. If you can't see a preview, then I can't see the preview and I can't grade it. In addition to cell phone pictures, which is what the majority of people do, if you're like a whiz and you have like a PDF editor, you can also upload PDFs. I'll take JPEGs, I'll take PDFs, and I'll even take Word documents if you format your math correctly. I'll explain that later. I cannot take any wacky zip files or any HEICs. Does that make sense, Evelyn? Yeah. So basically it's a breeze. Well, first of all, do you have a printer? Are you gonna print these sheets out for lab? Yeah. <clears throat> so you'll print them out and you'll take a photo. Just make sure that you go into your camera settings on your phone and make sure it's gonna save it as a JPEG. Unfortunately on iPhones, they don't tell you what the formats are. They just have two options save it as high resolution or save it as most compatible. And it's the most compatible that is the JPEG. Also on iPhones, if you go to your notes app, you can save it as a PDF there. Oh, okay. really? That's yeah, amazing. so there's a camera option in the notes and it's, you select save as PDF. And then that's hey, I got an idea. At the, can, I did this yesterday and it was so smart. Uh, the first time I taught this class, I just said, upload it, see you later. And it was just fucking chaos. There was all these people doing all this stuff. You know what I did yesterday that totally solved this problem? I just, we all took a moment collectively and everyone just uploaded it together and we clicked on all the names from my, I shared my screen so we could see if it worked. So do we wanna do that the first time? We'll just make sure everybody got to submit their thing correctly. It, yeah. it takes about five minutes and then we'll be sure there's no problems. So at the end of class, at the end of lab, we'll all just submit and I'll share screen and we'll just click on your names and we'll see if it showed up. So uh, Evelyn, that ought to be a good test of whether or not it's working, okay? All right, great. And, and by the way, Laura, we're gonna wanna ask you about that again later, okay? Because that sounds pretty useful. <clears throat> okay. All right, um, okay, so we're just a few minutes behind schedule, but I think it's time for us to uh, move on to the uh, main part of today's lecture. So I'm gonna exit the preview here. Um, like I said, if you guys have been following along with your lecture notes, we just completed lecture zero. Lecture zero is an introduction to 1020, and I talked about all these things more or less. We're now going to move on to lecture one, which is numbers in the nighttime sky uh, under your lecture notes. Let's just go here and uh, download that. Should only take a second. Okay. Um, these are not great lecture notes. They're kind of crappy Roman numeral outlines and they're a few years out of date. But I tried to put some useful things in here like sometimes I have conversion factors and main points I want to talk about. You probably, especially if you're not going to get a book, Catherine, will want to take the notes that I write down on the whiteboard. But this is just kind of to help you follow along with what I'm doing top down structure wise. Also very helpful if I forget to cover a module then you'll know that I meant to talk about that. And then you can ask me or we can, you know, figure something out. <clears throat> so let's get on into it. Let's learn about uh, some aspects of the nighttime sky. Mm, not that, but that. Okay, F5, shoot. Oh, okay, that works. All right, so the purpose of our first set of lectures <clears throat> It's just to go over some basics and teach you guys how to talk smart about some of the objects that we see in our sky. How do we talk about stars? How do we track their rotations? It's more complicated that you, than you think. Um, there's a whole bunch of basics that we need to cover. Let's start with something real simple. I don't know if you guys know what this is that you're looking at, but it's called the Pioneer Plaque. And they attached this, this copper or bronze plaque to the Pioneer spacecraft, which would be the first man-made object to ever leave the solar system. And it's kind of like a little you are here map for space aliens that might have found the spacecraft. They show a man and a woman in relationship to the spacecraft antenna. They map out lengths in the scale of a hydrogen molecule, which a smart alien would have to know about, especially if they took 1020. Um, they show the spacecraft coming from the third planet from the sun 
and they show our sun's location relative to a bunch of pulsars. Basically, it's a recipe for how to find us and invade us and possibly even eat us, okay? So I'm not sure if that was such a good idea now, but it was nice to, to tell people where the spacecraft came from. And maybe you'd like to know where you, you're located in the universe too. So if you didn't know, uh, welcome to space. You live on planet Earth, okay? You are one of many planets in our solar system. There are eight planets now in our solar system. Um, Pluto is now a dwarf planet, and there are others as well, like Ceres and Eris. My 1010 class covers the planets of the solar system in detail. We might talk about the planets a wee bit, but we mostly want to get the hell out of our solar system as fast as possible and get our asses to deep space. Uh, what would happen if I left the solar system? Where would I be? What's outside of the solar system? Milky Way. Yeah. If you zoom out, the next level of structure is the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is a vast assemblage of stars, the little wimpy planets they have surrounding them. <clears throat> but galaxies also contain tremendous quantities of gas. Now, uh, I don't know if it was Evelyn I was talking to earlier, but Evelyn, this is an artist illustration of the Milky Way, right? We think it looks similar to the Andromeda galaxy, which I showed you before, our sister galaxy. Why don't I have a picture, a real picture of the Milky Way to show you? You can't get outside of it. That's right. It's so damn big that it would take us way too long. It would take us hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of years for us at our current speeds of travel to get sufficiently far outside it that we could turn around and take a picture of it. We're like a ladybug sitting on a little leaf in the forest. And it's hard for that ladybug to see the entire forest from a distance, right? Um, by the way, Evelyn, we do have pictures of the Milky Way nonetheless, but we'll get to those eventually. I want to wait until you're trained. They're not, it's a picture from inside the Milky Way, so it doesn't look as good. But you know, one of the sad things about astronomy is we, in some senses, we know more about the Milky Way than other galaxies can we, because we have up close views of the internal stars. But our galaxy is the only galaxy we can see that we don't have a really good clear cut picture of. Um, for many years, <clears throat> when I was a student, the general wisdom was that our galaxy probably looked almost identical to the Andromeda galaxy seen here. We're about the same size and we're sister galaxies, so we're about the same age and all that, although all galaxies are kind of the same age. Um, Today, we know that our galaxy probably resembles something a little bit more like NGC 1300. We don't think that our bar is as big as NGC 1300, but we believe that our own galaxy is a barred spiral galaxy. Some galaxies have this kind of cool bar-like structure, which is neat, and we now believe the Milky Way does as well. So it's sad because we can see all these beautiful galaxies like NGC 1300, but the only galaxy that we can't see a zoomed out picture of is our own, which is extremely frustrating. <clears throat> uh, we do have a model of it, of course, by studying the rotations of stars, and I'll get to that in good time. Um, what if you leave the Milky Way galaxy? What's outside of that? Anyone know? <coughs> it's okay if you don't, but I... <coughs> Star Trek. <laughs> well, Star Trek, I don't think they even left the galaxy. They weren't that cool. Were they? Um, um, F5, slide 10. Um, outside of our galaxy is something called the local group of galaxies. Galaxies assemble themselves into gravitational groups. So here's the Milky Way floating over here. Uh, oh, well, can I just... Oh, that's dope. There's the Milky Way. Sorry, I'm learning how to play with all the toys here. Here's our sister galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. And you'll notice that there's a bunch of little dirtbag galaxies, little small dwarf elliptical galaxies that surround the Milky Way. These are like little dogs nipping at the master's heels here. And Andromeda's got a bunch of little dirtbag dwarf elliptical galaxies as well, kind of swirling around it. And we believe these galaxies oftentimes crash into each other and collide with each other. And there's even larger structures than galaxy groups if you keep zooming out, you find that galaxies also assemble themselves into superclusters. In this depiction, every white dot you see is itself a galaxy, and they're clumped into these 
they call them filaments. And then there are these regions where there are no galaxies, bubbles, and voids. In fact, if you keep zooming out, you find that galaxies are arranged in kind of like a, a sort of filament spiderweb-like shape, uh, where there are regions where galaxies are clumped together due to gravity, and then creepy little voids of intergalactic space where just nothing, or so we think nothing exists, um, like the Boote's void. Um, if you keep zooming out, eventually the galaxy, or the, I'm sorry, the entire universe starts to resemble a fine paste of galaxies. On very, very large scales, the universe is kind of a smooth paste of galaxies. And, and the entire universe is the totality of all the galaxies and stars and gas that's found in it. We're going to try to cover as much of this as we can uh, in the time we have. But I'd like to start uh, with a lesson. Okay, it's time for us to do some work. You guys got your notebooks and your pencils out? All right. Let's start with our first lesson. You can see that there's a lot of stuff for us to talk about in the universe. Our first lesson is how to manage the very large numbers that we're going to have to work with here in our astronomy class. So our first lesson is on scientific notation. Maybe some of you have uh, encountered this before, but you're encountering it again. Uh, does anyone want to take a guess at how many stars are in the Milky Way galaxy? No, no, I don't want to guess. Okay. Shay, I, I thought you or Laura might remember. I have the worst memory of anybody I know, so don't count on me. That's all right. It's okay. Well, you know, this stuff doesn't come natural. You have to learn it uh, through repetition, so that's fair. Uh, <clears throat> A trillion? Very no. good, Laura. One trillion stars. Show off. She <laughs> <laughs> was consulting some notes there where we consulting our notes. You were. That's okay. People can look things up in books. That's legit. And Laura, while you're at it, how many zeros are in the trillion? Twelve. That's right. Let's write that down. That's approximately the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. That's a big number. Damn big number. In fact, check out my Casio calculator here, and I want you to watch my moves, OK? I'm going to punch some numbers in. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. That's it. My Casio calculator only has 10 decimal places. But the number trillion has 13 digits in it. So you can't put the number trillion into your calculator the good old fashioned way. Also, you are not allowed to write this down in your homeworks because I don't want to count that many zeros. It's not fun to look at. One trillion is a big number compared to maybe your bank account, but it's a small number for astronomers who often have to measure stars, and the masses of planets and things like that. So the old way of just writing numbers down ain't gonna work for us anymore. We're gonna need a method of compacting the number into a smaller form. And we're gonna do this using the powers of math, okay? Let's take a trip down memory lane from your math class. Um, we can, well actually let's diagram this number, can we? So here we have something called the lead digit. The lead digit is the first number in your number. It's a number between one and nine. It's the first number that is not zero, okay? Then we have the number of zeros. The number of zeros tells you how big your number is. It is sometimes referred to uh, as the order of magnitude.
The order of magnitude is a phrase that's asking the question, how big is my number? Is it of order thousand? Is it of order million, billion, trillion? Lastly, but not leastly, we have the little tag called the units. And the unit tells us, well, I guess here it's just a single unit. The unit tells us what we are measuring. You may not have thought about this before, but all numbers, every single number, whether it's the size of your bank account or the number of teeth in your head, they are all measurements. And to measure something, you have to know what units you're using. In this case, my meter stick is measuring things in units of centimeters. But I could grade this ruler out in many possible ways. For instance, those small little tick marks that you see, those are millimeters. I could measure the width of my big mouth in centimeters or in millimeters. And it depends, the number depends on what units I'm using. The units tell you what it is you're measuring. And by paying close attention to units, you learn what it means to do science. There's a lot of science packed away in units, and you will discover this in time. OK, um, <clears throat> let's make use of some powers of 10 to contract this number into a more manageable form. And just, just to take a trip down memory lane, uh, let's remember how powers of 10 work. 10 to the power of 1 means 10 times 1, and that's 10. 10 to the power of 2 means you multiply two 10s together. That gives us 100. 10 to the power of 3 means multiply three 10s together. And that gives you 1,000. I see what's going on here. Every time I raise 10 to a new power, I get a 1 followed by that many zeros. 10 to the 4 is just 10,000 because there's four zeros and 10 to the 5 is 100,000 because there's five zeros. OK, class, you give it a shot. What is 10 to the power of 0? Very good, Joel. Joel said 1. Many people think 10 to the power of 0 is 0, but that's not true, OK? Zero is not a natural number. In, in algebra, one is the default number, not zero. In fact, Joel, you'll notice that if 10 to the one is 10 times one, 10 to the zero means I'm multiplying no tens and leaving only the one behind. That's why. It's because any number can always be multiplied by one. 10 to the zero power means leave your default one in place and multiply by no tens. That's that's the logic behind it, OK? OK, um, <clears throat> we're going to use this fact to pack our number into scientific notation. So we start by writing down our lead digit, OK? So I write down the number 1. I've got 12 zeros, so I'll multiply them by 10 to the 12. And then I'll keep my unit of stars. And that, my friends, is how we write the number one trillion in scientific notation. All scientific notation has a format that looks something like this. You have a lead digit, sometimes followed by some other numbers. I usually call this the change, like dollars and cents, you know? Um, and then you're gonna multiply it by 10 to some power. This is what's called proper form in scientific notation. Now, because scientific notation always has forms of times 10, there's a very critical key on your calculator. On the, e on the Casio calculator, it's called the EXP key. And the EXP key means times 10. <clears throat> Let's take a look at it here. We don't have to hit times 10 anymore. We just hit EXP. Let me show you how I would type in a trillion. Um, it's 1 exp 12 and that's it you'll notice that your calculator does not display the times 10 sorry i'm trying to get this in focus because it doesn't have room for it anytime you see that little number up there that means your number is in scientific notation now if you're like evelyn and you're rocking one of them old-fashioned ti-85s you get a double e key instead that's your exp key i think joel probably has a 
double E key. Some uh, cal it's huh? under the X. The 10 to the X on mine. No, you don't want that one. Hold your calculator up. Oh. Hold your, hold your calculator up to the screen for me. Uh, you want the, the double E key is above your X to the minus one key. Do you see that? Oh, okay. Do you see the double E? Yeah. One of the reasons that that calculator is inferior to the Casio is you're going to have to hit second function or shift before you hit that key. And yeah. we use the EXP so many times in our class that you are literally going to be punching twice as many buttons as everyone else. And over the course of the class, well, your pinky, your index finger is going to get strong. Okay. So in any case, get, uh, get the Casio when you can shell out the eight bucks. It'll be easier for us just because of issues like that. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are using some bill collectors are calling me here. Uh, for those of you who are using uh, your crappy little calculator phones, sometimes they don't even call it double E. Oh, in mine, they call it EXP. Some calculators actually write out the times 10, but Joel, that 10 to the power of X key just raises 10 to the power of X. It's a stupid key and it shouldn't be there. Ignore that thing, okay? Use double E. Yeah. Now listen, when I write things into my calculator, I type one EXP12, I will see in my display one 12. So this is what you type. This is what you see, but you will never, ever, ever write that down on your paper. I got to make this explicit. If you write this down, unfortunately for you guys, I speak math and I will read that as one to the power of 12. Does anyone know what one to the power of 12 is? One. That's right. Is one the same thing as a trillion? No. No. Sure. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to get confused. I don't want to be asking myself, well, what did Evelyn really mean? What did Joel really mean? I don't want to get inside your mind like that, okay? Um, I need you to speak math the right way. I need you to write the times 10 back in. And this is an important, I know that I need to talk about this because otherwise we would bother. Sometimes people just forget and they write down what they see in the calculator. That's not okay, so you have to write that down. Is that okay? We will always, we will always write the times 10, but we will never type the times 10. Okay. Let's try one more example and then we move on. Can I erase? Okay. Let's take a number like nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Does anyone know how to say that number in plain English? You're supposed to put commas after every three digits, right? So you put a comma there, and a comma there, and a comma there. What is that number? Nine billion, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay. Nine billion, blah, 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 blah. Our lead digit, Joel, is what? Nine. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend like all of these are zeros, but we're going to keep them as change. 9.8765432.1. We don't need to keep the zero. Times 10. Now, um, the power is how many times we had to move the decimal point. So if the decimal point was here, I'm pretending like all the numbers up to nine were zero. I want to move my decimal point to where this comma is. So I just slide it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places. 9.8765432.1 times 10 to the nine. A reasonable student could say, dude, I thought the point of this number was to make it smaller and more compactful. This looks even worse than that does. You would be correct. But the issue is most of the time we do not need to keep all of these digits in the change. This part of the number is what's known as the precision. I'm going to be talking about precision in today's lab and what that means. Normally we can just round our number. And until you know what you're doing, you should probably just round to like two digits. That's a safe move. 
Now, if you guys remember the rules for rounding, if I want to cut my number there, if the number that I'm about to chop off is five or greater, I have to round this dude up. If the number I'm going to chop is less than five, I keep it flat. Seven is greater than five, so I would round this number as nine point nine times ten to the nine. And now it looks a bit more compactful. Joel, how would you say that number? Nine point nine times ten to the ninth. Sure, or you could say nine point nine billion. Which is fine. Or you could say 9 billion, 900 million, but I like 9.9 .9 billion the best. Okay. Let's make a quick little cheat sheet together of some common names of big numbers. These are numbers that just show up in our class all the time. And I'm going to want to say these words to you and know that you know. So I enjoy making tables. Um, we'll call this table powers of 10. This will be the name of my big number. This will be 10 to some power, 10 to the X. And this will be the sort of metric prefix that is often used to describe that number. Let's have a row for trillions, billions, millions, and thousands. So we already know that a trillion is 10 to the power of 12. How about a billion? How many zeros are in a billion? Nine. 10 to the power of nine. How about a million? Six. Six. And then a thousand. Three. Thank you. Now, do you guys know the metric prefixes for these numbers? Let's start easy. Let's start with a thousand. What's the metric prefix? M. Not M. No. If you have a thousand grams, you Kilo. have a Kilo. A kilo gram. How about a million? The abbreviation is M, but M is short for mega. <clears throat> if you have a megabyte, you have a thousand kilobytes. Billion? Giga? Giga. Trillion. Mm -hmm. Trillion. Nope. Tetra? Terra. Oh, yeah. A terabyte is a trillion bytes. Does anyone know what 10 to the power of 15 is? <clears throat> the trillion? Or you want the metric? The metric prefix. I believe it's a peta. There's names for all of them up all the way up to the bloody moon. Anyways, these are the ones that we'll encounter in our class most often. So it's good to have those uh, sort of in our back pockets there. Now listen, scientific notation, I bet some of you have, how many of you have seen scientific notation before today? Show of hands. Yeah, most people encounter it somewhere. And if you guys already know how this works, well, then I'm sorry for boring you, and that's fine. But it's kind of an essential tool. We're going to be using it all the time. I want to get to the point where you guys just kind of intuitively think in terms of these uh, sort of big numbers there. So, you know, if you understand it, great. But we're going to make sure that everyone knows how to do this. 
part of our lab today is I'm going to just have us do a bunch of little math problems and scientific notation. And I want to walk around the Hollywood squares and ask each of you to do a little problem. I'm going to walk you through it. But we got to know how to do this so that we can go forward. It's very easy for me to start pulling all these puzzle pieces together and suddenly lose you. So I don't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> we'll try scientific notation more a little bit later. Now we're going to get into talking about Earth and the orbit of Earth. Uh, and we're coming up on, actually, you know what? Maybe this would be a good time for a little tea break. You guys want to do a little mental relaxation? Everyone feel yeah. good about tea break? Okay. Yes, please. All right. Um, it's, uh, it's 137. It's almost 140. Let's give ourselves 15 minutes or so. Let's try to get started a little before two, maybe five minutes to two. or I don't know. I'll see how I'm feeling once I have a snack, okay? So give yourself <laughs> a little time to pause. I'm going to um, pause the recording during tea break <clears throat> uh, just so that I don't waste a lot of disk space. Uh, so I'll pause now. And we'll come back uh, just before two. Resume. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we're done with tea break and we're gonna continue our lecture. The next section is on Earth's orbit. Okay, so we wanna come up with a couple of basics. I've got a globe here, which ought to help us demonstrate some things. Um, it's a little better when we can do this in person. During the course of a 24 hour day, Earth spins on its axis if you look from above, from the North Pole, so if you're looking down like this, Earth has a counterclockwise spin. And you can see that's preserved here on our, our video or on our chat. Seen from the North Pole, Earth spins counterclockwise. And it's gonna turn out that this isn't, um, <clears throat> this isn't random, but all planets in our solar system, with one exception, are all spinning counterclockwise on their axis. Laura, Shay, does anyone remember which planet does not spin counterclockwise from our solar system class? I am really considering a change of grade for you guys. I'm gonna go back and retroactively punish you. Laura, you don't know which planet <laughs> spins slightly retrograde? Was it Venus? Very good. Your grade is preserved, that. okay? That's right, Venus is the one exception uh, to the rule that planets spin counterclockwise. <clears throat> Another weirdo is Uranus, just because Uranus is flopped over on its side, so that's kind of strange, but it spins counterclockwise seen from its Uranian North Pole. Uh, we call this the axis spin of a planet. So Earth has an axis spin, and that of course gives rise to the day. One day is equal to 24 hours. Now, I assumed that you already knew that one day is equal to 24 hours. If not, you've got problems. Um, but the reason why we're writing it down is because this is the first of one of many conversion factors that you're going to be learning about in this course. And conversion factors are really critical in science because they help us manage units. They relate one set of units, such as days, to another set of units, like hours. Much of the work we do in this course is just gonna be converting from one set of measurements to another set. And I'll be giving you some skills in that before we end today. Sorry, my autofocus is acting funny. Okay, so in addition to Earth's axis spin, we also have its orbital period. Its orbital period is its revolution around the sun. And, uh, <clears throat> Like its axis spin, the orbits of all planets and all asteroids all orbit the sun counterclockwise as well. The orbital period, of course, gives rise to one year, which is 365 days. Another thing that I'm doing when I write these conversion factors down is I show you the abbreviations that we're going to use collectively as a class. As Earth orbits around the sun, uh, here I'd like to share a screen with you guys. It's spinning on its axis counterclockwise. It's orbiting the sun counterclockwise. Um, <clears throat> there are two points in the, the Earth's orbit almost looks perfectly like a circle, but it's not quite a circle. There is a point where it's slightly closer to the sun in orbit, that's known as the perihelion, and a point where it's slightly farther from the sun called the aphelion. Let's take those down as vocabulary notes as well. 
So there's the perihelion. That's the point in orbit closest to the sun. And then there's the aphelion. the point in orbit farthest from the sun, okay? Now, <clears throat> there's a slight difference, a slight difference in the uh, distance. It seems like a lot when you look at it on paper, but it's a fraction of the average distance between the Earth and the sun. It varies from 147 million kilometers to 152 million kilometers. Now, 5 million kilometers sounds like a lot if you compare it to the length of your driveway, but it's not so big if you compare it to the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that has a definition in this class. It's called an astronomical unit. And this is a new unit of measurement that's appropriate for measuring out solar system size distances. Let's take that down. 1 AU is equal to 150 million kilometers. Uh, and this is what is known as an astronomical unit. So it occurs to me that we probably should have a discussion about the metric system. Uh, let me introduce you some metric units of length. Here in my hands, I'm holding a meter stick. You can see it's kind of like a yard, but better, okay? Meter sticks are graded out in, uh, oops, in centimeters. I think I showed you this before tea break. Two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. A centimeter is about the width of your, maybe your pinky fingernail. Your pinky fingernail has a width of roughly one centimeter. You'll notice that it's subdivided into smaller little tick marks called millimeters. A millimeter is like the head of a pin or so. And we're gonna be measuring out units of distance in our class in meters, centimeters, millimeters, and kilometers. So let's do a little bit of notes on that. Uh, class, can I erase up top? Do you have this? Okay. Okay, so we could have a little note here on metric units of length. We have the standard unit in the metric system, the meter. Its abbreviation is 1M. Uh, one meter contains 100 centimeters or 1,000 millimeters. Note to self, that means one centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters. We'll use those, centimeters and millimeters are used often in our labs, so that's worthwhile to talk about. Honestly, you probably ought to have known that from the get-go, but so what? Um, when you want to measure distances on the Earth, kilometers are more appropriate. And you guys already remember that a kilo means how many zeros? Three. That's right. One kilometer is therefore equal to a thousand meters. Put a box around this conversion factor and put stars next to it. I happen to know that this is a conversion factor that we're going to use all the damn time. And people don't kind of remember it. They don't know it intrinsically. So we really have to drive that home in your head. You're going to want to look that up in the future. So in that case, an astronomical unit, which is not technically a metric unit, but is measured in terms of them, I suppose, an astronomical unit is defined as the average distance between Earth and the Sun. It has a value of 150 million kilometers. In this class, I would like to institute a rule. Our rule will be that any number which is greater than a million must be placed in scientific notation, okay? 
So I'm fine if you guys want to write down the number 9,999. But as soon as it ticks over to a million, I prefer scientific notation. So since um, 1AU clearly violates that rule, uh, I'd like to get someone from the class to help me put it in the scientific notation. Uh, Will, I haven't talked to you too much yet today. So uh, you, Will, do you think you could handle that? Could you figure out how to put this number into scientific notation? Uh, honestly, I'm my uh, the writing's really blurry on my on my screen. I'm doing the best I can trying to. Okay, well, keep this up is something me. I need to talk about. So, part of it is my autofocus. Um, is that better or is it still blurry? Oh, that's better. I think I just needed to get a little bit closer. Everyone says that's better. Uh, yeah. My camera does this thing where it's trying to autofocus all the time, so it sometimes gets blurry, but it should clear up. Uh, especially if I stay like in this position here. Is that good enough for you to read it, Will, or are you still struggling? No, I can, I can see it now. Yeah. Do you have me in speaker view, like in the main large view? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Mm -hmm. All right. So help me put that number to scientific notation, if you don't mind. Oh, geez. Um, What's your lead digit? I'll help you here. Uh, 15. Uh, 15? Okay, you can do that. Fine, let's, let's do it your way for starters. Um, one of you, Will's gonna start with 15 and then what, times 10 to the what? Uh, seven. Right, kilometers. Now listen, this is weird, okay? But it's okay. We're gonna call this Will's method, okay? <laughs> Will's method is allowed, but it's definitely weird, okay? Um, gotcha. Now, proper form should require our lead digit to have a single digit between one and nine. 15 is too big to be a lead digit, Will. It's not that you can't so do one. that. <laughs> so what would it look like if we did proper form? Uh, one. But you want to keep some change, right? Do you, do you understand what I mean there? Don't uh, throw away the five. Say what now? Don't throw away the five. Uh, 1.5. Times 10 to the what? Times 10 to the uh, seven. Hold on. You may have seven zeros, but if you put the decimal point there, you're essentially treating the five like a zero as well, right? Uh, okay. Because you move the decimal place one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oops, sorry. Don't count the comma. <laughs> what would my power be then, Will? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's right. And Will, this is proper form. Okay. All right. We're going to be doing our lab today in proper form. That's traditionally how people do it. By the way, uh, you can look up some of these quantities in the appendix in the back of the book. And if we go to appendix A, and we look up an astronomical unit as the first conversion factor, you'll notice they put it in proper form where, oh, shit, this is just in focus and now I lost it. Come on, you stupid camera. You're always trying to focus close when I don't want you to. One you is 1.5 times 10 to the eight. Do you see how they use proper form there, Will? Mm -hmm. Guess what? I'm an even bigger weirdo than you, pal. I do it even stranger than this, okay? So whereas, whereas Will made it weird, I'm gonna make it extra weird. I'm gonna slide the decimal place back even one more. And my favorite way to write one AU is to write this. One astronomical unit is 150 times 10 to the six kilometers, okay? Put a box around that because this, my friends, this is good math style, okay? If you're styling, that's how you write down 150 million. Does anyone know why I wrote it like that? Classy. Class, it's classy. Pinky's out, okay? Why, uh, why'd I do it like that? Makes it easier because you can just go like, okay, six, you just know that it's six zeros. Six zeros is what? What do we call that? 
uh, you know. Consult the chart, Shay. You I made did, a chart. Uh, One million. Right. So how would I read that then, Shay? Uh, 150 times 1 million kilometers. Or 150 million kilometers. Right, right, right. That's why, that's why yeah. I wrote it that way. So I could read it in my mind. In my mind, it would roll off my mind as 150 million kilometers. Sometimes you'll see me wiggling the decimal place around so that I can get my powers of 10 into thousands, millions, billions, and trillions. Like you said, Shay, classy, okay? Um, Good answer. Now that you know what the definition of an AU is, what's the damn point? The damn point is if you want to remember the distances to planets, it's going to get real annoying if you do it in kilometers because you're going to have to remember that one planet is 1.562 billion million kilometers and you're going to start to get nauseous. You won't be able to remember everything. But an astronomical unit is kind of like a new meter stick that you can use to measure out distances to planets and the numbers come out <clears throat> cute, okay? Now, I tend to think of any number between one and zero as a percentage. So you'll notice that Mercury is about 40% of an AU from the sun. Venus is about 70% of an AU from the sun. Here's Earth, it's one AU. Mars is 1.5 AU. Watch what happens when we get to the outer solar system here. Um, Jupiter, 5 AU. Saturn, 10 AU. 20 AU to Uranus, 30 AU to Neptune. Pluto's orbit is about 40 AU on average, although it's highly squished. And I would say that like the whole solar system, edge to edge, if it's a disk, the disk of the solar system is like 100 astronomical units in diameter. So that's nice because just about any distances you want to measure in astronomical units, as long as you're within our solar system, the numbers should come out between 1 and 100. That's what makes AUs kind of helpful, all right? Now, um, I want to try a little sample problem with you guys because sometimes, even though you know the distance to a planet in astronomical units, sometimes you want to you do a calculation or you want to figure out how many kilometers that is. And this is very important because this is the kind of sample problems I'm going to be asking you to do in homework. Obviously, if you did them on your own, it could be a little bit scary, but I'm trying to teach you the methods that we're going to use here. So I want you to follow along with me. Any objections to me erasing this? because it's about to go. All right. Let's try a little simple sample problem together, okay? So here's a question. If Pluto's average distance is 40 AU from the sun, the question I want to know is, how many kilometers is that? Now, before I teach, oops, sorry. You guys are chopped off there. You see that? If you were asked to do this question on your own, would anyone know how to solve this without my help? What's the answer to this question? Can anyone do this before I show you my way? No one? What if I just made the entire class one big pop quiz right now? If Pluto is 40 AU from the sun, how many kilometers is that? You either get 100 or you get a zero in the whole class. And then we just take time off and, you know, take it easy. How many of you would be able to pass the course? One day I'm going to do something crazy like that. The powers are vested in me to totally make a mess of things. <laughs> How would I solve that problem? Can anyone do it? It's scientific, uh, the, um, what's that called? Oh yeah, what is that called? The thing I'm about to teach you. Yeah, we said it a million times last time. All right. <clears throat> All right. Let's start here. Apparently, no one knows how to solve that problem. So you guys are definitely going to get your money's worth in this class, okay? Whether through apathy or just lack of knowledge, you are about to be trained in the arts of dimensional analysis. Okay, the first thing is to recognize that this is, it's a unit conversion problem. And unit conversion problems show up all the time in science in a variety of different ways. The essence of a unit conversion problem is, I have some number of, say, astronomical units, 
and I need to convert them to some number of kilometers. And this can take many different forms, sneakily. Um, there's a technique for us to solve these problems. I am now gonna teach you what is called the four steps of dimensional analysis. And it's a simple four-step plan that will help you solve tricky problems like this in the future. Here's step one. Step one is to write down the number to convert with its units. So class, to begin this problem, what number would I want to write down? 40 AU. Very good. That's the number I'm trying to convert, so I'm just going to write it down. 40 AU. Okay. Step two is actually even easier. Step two is we're just going to multiply by a division bar. Okay? Now, this is how we multiply by a division bar. We make a times, and then we put a nice long division bar, just like so. That's because conversion factors, they, conversion problems either involve multiplication or division, and it can get confusing sometimes, so we're going to keep our options open. If we put something on the top, we multiply. If it's in the bottom, we divide. Now, the third step is the heart of what makes dimensional analysis cool. We're going to use units to guide our thinking, not numbers. So in step three, we are going to put the units in first to cancel, okay? Put units in first to cancel. And what that means is, whether or not you realize it, 40 AU is actually part of a little secret fraction. Because I can divide any number by one, any number that you write down, like the number five or the number six, are technically always in the numerator or the top of a secret fraction. So even though 40 AU looks like it's in the middle of the line, you need to recognize that it is distinctly in the top. And that's helpful because it means that I can put astronomical units down on the bottom. And if I do this, then, whoosh, oops, sorry, that doesn't work. I'll try that again. Whoosh. Now my astronomical units will cancel each other out, okay? That, that's how I kill the astronomical units. The units I put on the top are the units that I want to convert into, which are kilometers. That's step three. You'll notice that I didn't soil my dirty little grubby hands with any numbers. I didn't touch any dirty numbers. I just started with units so that I can think clean, okay? Now, after you've done the good work, then it comes time for the nasty bits at the bottom here. Step four is we put in the numbers second, put the numbers in second, and to do this, we use our conversion factors. Geez, guys, if only I had a conversion factor from kilometers to AUs, then I'd know how to solve this problem. I wonder where I could get such a thing. Where would I find something like that? In our notes. Okay, so why don't you tell me what the notes say then? One AU is 150 times 10 to the six kilometers. That's right, we're gonna to have to have that in our back pocket. Okay, now there's still a trick here that you can screw up. Which number goes on top and which number goes on bottom? One goes on the bottom with AU. It's one AU and that's equal to how many kilometers? 150 times 10 to the six. Okay. Great. Now it's time to do the job on our Casio calculators making use of our EXP key, 
Now, we don't really need uh, to have the one there, and that one will stay there, but we don't need to punch it in. I want you to watch me do this in my calculator, and you're going to do it the same way. Listen, I'm going to make up an important point here. You ain't going to learn math just by watching me punch buttons. I already can do math. That's why I've got a college degree and a job, and I know what the hell I'm doing, okay? To learn how to do math, you need to punch after me. Now I am your calculator Jesus. You will do this in memory of me exactly as I say. I'm telling you, if you don't punch, you're going to miss out on something, okay? So watch me punch and follow along with me, okay? So I'm going to do 40 times 150. Now we're not going to type 10. We're just going to do EXP 6. And then I'll skip the divided by one and then equals. Is that what you got? Yep. Okay, what is that number? I'm gonna Six show times. that once more, once more while it's in focus for the people in the, one more time for the people in the back, okay? Hold on, let me get this nicely focused. This fucking autofocus feature drives me crazy. Uh. Hmm. I had it in perfect focus before, but if you're going to be an engineer in the future, if you design an autofocus and you take away my control, your algorithm better fucking work. Not like this guy who built this camera. If you're listening on YouTube later, whoever you are, sir or madam, you screwed up and you make me angry every day. I'm going to find you one day. I'm going to write you a very unhappy email. Okay, so here, let's try this again. So four, here we go. 40 times 150 EXP6 equals. All right, what is that number? Six times 10 to the nine kilometers. Notice her good style there. That number was bigger than a million, so she put it right into scientific notation. That's what I want. And now box the answer, because that's a classy move. Pinky's out, okay? You put a box around your answer so that your sorry professor who has to grade your sloppy homeworks knows what you think. This is you saying, I believe that this is the final answer, okay? That's how things are gonna look in this class. That's how you do math like a pro, okay? And our math is always gonna look like this. You have your units, you cancel things out, Mwah. just kiss to the chef, okay? So um, <clears throat> that was a relatively easy problem. The problems that we do will get harder. If you master dimensional analysis, you will become smarter and better, and problems that were previously too confusing for you to even think about will now become crystal clear, like water in the Caribbean, okay? It's gonna, you're gonna see your way to the solution uh, like a clairvoyant, and you gotta trust me on this. Uh, I've got some time and I'd like to demonstrate it. In fact, Let's do something related to a couple of our problems in the homework. Let's find out if you have what it takes to teach art, okay? This next module in your class is, do you have what it takes to teach art? And by which I mean, uh, sometimes like a fun thing you can do with your students if you're an art teacher, is <clears throat> you can have your students construct a paper mache model of the solar system. Hold on, I think I have a little gadget over here. A gadget that's special to me that I want to share with you. Just a second, kids. I'm looking for something. Okay. Years ago, someone as a joke gave me a little marble of planet Earth. But I've got to say that I, I actually really love... Where is it here? Can we focus this? I love this little marble of planet Earth. It's, it's wonderful. They use blue glass for the water and green for the continents. And they're all on there. Let's see if we can, there's Australia, there's North America. Look how cute that is. It'd be nice if this thing would focus. Come on. So what if we wanted to make a model of the solar system where, you know, we made the Earth the size of a marble or something? And maybe the sun would be the size of a beach ball or, and, and we'd have like a paper mache beach ball. And 
we'll have the students cover it in chicken wire and they can paint the sun. And we'll say, okay, kids, this here is the sun. Now take all your planets, take all these little marbles and BBs and spheres that represent the size of the planets. And I want you to figure out how far away you have to go to place these various planets so you can make a scale model of the solar system. But if you're gonna run this class as an art teacher, you're gonna to have to know how far away to tell the kids to go if they wanna build a little scale model of the solar system. So uh, let's, start with, let's start with something fun, a reasonable size for the sun. Let's, let's say we wanted to make the sun about this big. This is the size of my celestial globe. I want you guys to help me measure this in centimeters. Oops. Oh, shucks. There go my planets. Hold on. All right, I'm still getting used to this teaching at home thing, guys. It's not everything is cracked up to be here. Okay. Help me measure the diameter, the approximate diameter of this globe. I'm going to hold it up to the uh, lens here. Wait, I need to position this. Sorry, I'm trying to. Can you guys tell how many centimeters this is roughly? All right. I'm, I can't really hold it up well. Let me try to measure it. I'm going to put it down at my feet. I'm going to hold this across. I get about 40, 40 centimeters. Okay, that's what I measure, just roughly speaking. Uh, here we go. So take some notes with me here. By the way, do you have this? You have all this down? This is the most important notes that I gave you today. Please put big stars next to this. I'm going to want you to call them up afterwards. Here. What's um, number two? Say? Number two says multiply by a division bar. I want you to put a big smiley face next to this in your notebooks. I'm gonna ask you to find the smiley face later, okay? Please. And then the last part of number one, what's it? it says write down the number to convert what? With its units. Okay. Hey, Will, is it my camera or is it the internet? How many other people see it blurry? Because it looks really clear on my screen. Joel, it's clear. It's clear. Yeah, so, I'm using a computer from like 1980, so it's... <laughs> Probably. Just print it out on your dot matrix mm -hmm. printer. Um, Will, I should have these up on YouTube after. Uh, let me okay. go. But Will, let me just read it out for you. Right? I got them all. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. So let's try this scale model thing. I'm going to erase this. Put a smiley face there, Will. We're going to want to find that later. Okay, let's make a scale model of the solar system. Okay, do you have what it takes, otherwise known as, do you have what it takes to teach art? Oops, sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna have a beach ball, a paper mache sun, and the sun is gonna have a diameter of the size of that sphere of 40 centimeters. Now, we have to know how big the sun really is. I know that the radius of the sun, by the way, this is the astrological symbol for the sun, it's about 700,000 kilometers. So what would the diameter be if I multiplied the diameter? The radius times two is the diameter, correct? What's 700,000 times two? Aw, oh, snap. Somebody didn't have coffee today, and that somebody is all of you, okay? What's 700,000 times two? Sarah, I volunteer you to answer that question. Aren't you glad you shared your video with me? 1.4 million. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, let's write that up there. 1.4, how many zeros is that, Sarah? Nine. That's billion, buddy. How many million? Six. So Good. Five. Okay. 
when you make a scale model of a solar system, you're in a way kind of creating your own funky conversion factor. And this is how map making is done as well. Essentially what you've decided is you've decided that you're gonna peg 40 uh, centimeters to, uh, to be equal to 1.4 million kilometers. So when you build a scale model, you kind of invent your own conversion factor. Now here, I need to point out a problem that might not be obvious to you guys the first time around, but it's a very critical problem. 1.4 million kilometers can be converted to centimeters in reality. And it's not gonna be 40, right? Because look, one single bloody meter, one bloody meter has 100 centimeters in it. So if I had like a million kilometers, that would be a shitload of centimeters in reality. I've seen this before and I'm worried that we're gonna confuse the scale model centimeters, the paper mache centimeters of our students with the real centimeters of reality and nature. So I'm gonna put a little prime above the centimeters. The prime means fake centimeters. And it reminds me that these aren't real centimeters in outer space, but these are centimeters in my paper mache model. The wisdom of this has been borne out by many different exercises. Okay, now I wanna know how far away these kids have to go so I can put a little marble earth. That's the question. The question is how far do I have to go to get to earth in fake centimeters. Anyone know how to do that? Do you have to find the diameter of Earth? Let's say we... Let's say we don't want to get, we could also make this crazier. Who said that? Oh, it was Evelyn. Oh, Evelyn. Evelyn, if we wanted to go really effing nuts, like if I had another hour with you, I would actually make you figure out how big the marble should be. But because we have limited time, Evelyn, I think it's going to be long-winded enough, me just telling you how far to go to get to Earth. So let's say this is the Earth marble that we're going to use. We've already set the size. To be honest with you, Evelyn, compared... So the sun, this, this is not to scale. Um, I think the sun, you can fit 1 million earths inside the sun. I don't think I could fit a million of these marbles inside of this thing. So the sun, if we actually made earth, it would actually have to be smaller than this marble to scale. So that problem will get, we can also do that with dimensional analysis as well, but let's not worry about the diameter of earth. Let's worry about how far Earth is from the sun. And how far is that, Evelyn? One AU. Beautiful. Okay, Evelyn, so what are we gonna do? Um, convert, um, convert something. Convert uh, what? What do you- One AU into yes. uh, centimeters prime. Into fake centimeters, centimeters prime. You are right there and swinging. And guess what technique you're gonna to use to do that, Evelyn? Dimensional, no, not dimensional. Is it di dimensional conversion analysis? Dimensional something. Dimen look at the smiley face. Look at dimensional, the smiley face. <laughs> dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis, you were right yeah. there. Okay, good. What's your first step in dimensional analysis, Evelyn? Um, you have to write down the, what you're converting, so the AU. How many? One. One AU. Okay, so I'll write that down. Then what's your second step? Um, multiply, set up like the multiply by a division bar. Beautiful. What's your third step? Cancel out the... Um, put units in to cancel. Put un put uh, the division bar under AU. You mean AU you under the division bar, right? Yes. Good. That's smart, Evelyn, because that will cancel out my AU. Then what do I want to do? Um, put another division bar 
under the one. Well, wait, you got to finish the job here. What? Oh, you're... put centimeters prime as your unit. Okay, here's the issue, Evelyn. That would be okay, and ultimately that's what you would like to do. But Evelyn, you can only do that if you already have a conversion factor from AUs to centimeters, to fake centimeters. Mm. But Evelyn, if you had that, we'd already be done with the problem because we'd know how many centimeters are in one AU. In other words, Evelyn, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with what you did, except that you don't have a conversion factor from fake centimeters to AU. You have a conversion factor from fake centimeters to what? Two kilometers to the right. diameter of the sun. So, well, forget about the numbers. Just talk kilometers, okay? So, does that suggest to you what might go up here instead? Do you convert it to kilometers first and then yes. to centimeters? Okay, so let's do steps. Sometimes you have to do steps two and three on repeat before you can do step four. So let's go back to step two again. And you even suggested that. You said, let's multiply by another division bar. What units should go in now? Centimeters prime. Where? Tell me what to put top and bottom. On top. And what goes on bottom then? Kilometers. That's right, because then kilometers can cancel with the kilometers on top. Ready? Okay. Okay, Evelyn, you're doing great. Now you've got to com continue to step four. Step four is, what does it say? Um, you have to plug in the... Regurgitate the, the Bible. The, you, you put in the numbers the second using conversion factors. Put in the numbers second using conversion factors. We will continue to regurgitate from this list until it's memorized. Okay, so help me find the conversion factor from AUs to kilometers. Um, the one AU is, what did I say? One AU is 150 times 10 to the six kilometers. So we put that on top, right? Mm. Sure. Okay, what numbers do I put over here? 40. Where do I put 40? On top. On the top. And what do I put on the bottom? 1.4 times 10 to the sixth. You are good. That's good. I'm going to be enjoying. Actually, you're no fun. You're too good. Okay. Next time I'm like, <laughs> doesn't know what they're doing. And that's more. <laughs> Okay. All right. So that's great. Look what Evelyn did. She put the right conversion factors. One AU is equal to 150 million, 40 fake centimeters to kilometers. Are we ready to punch it, kids? Here's what we're going to do. Every time something's on the top, we're going to multiply. Anytime something's on the bottom, we're going to divide, and we're going to use that EXP key. I'm going to skip the ones. I'm going to do this times this divided by that. Let's go for it, shall we? Can you do it without me? Bet you you can't. So I'm gonna start with 150 million EXP6. I'm gonna times it by 40. Then I will divide by 1.4 EXP6. And then I will it equals, and you tell me what you get. Joseph, Catherine, wrong. Jose, I want to hear from all of you. I want you punching. If you ain't punching, you're nothing. You're slime. You don't deserve to live. You need to punch into your calculators, okay? What'd you get, Evelyn? Uh, I just cleared it because I thought it was wrong. <laughs> right. It was like 4,280-something. 4, 4, very good. All right, so you, you actually got it right. So I don't know. Could you punch it in again? Why um, don't you don't because you it didn't seem wrong unless you know the right answer, right? It's true. Um, for the putting, because I'm doing it on my phone calculator, yep. for the um, uh, putting in the 10 to the 6th, do you 
you don't have to put the 10, right? You just do. No, you just hit, well, what's your, see, because if you got some wacky calculator, I don't know what it looks like. On this phone calculator, I, XP key, what does it look I like? Have, I have an EE key. Okay, yeah, can, can you hold it, hold on, let me, can I zoom in on you? Wait a second, sure. I gotta go to speaker mode. Oh yeah, you wanna use the double E key there, Evelyn. Yeah. Okay, so you okay. would type 150 double E6. It sounds like you did it right, honestly. Double E6 times 40, right? Times Divide 40? by 1.4 um, E6. Yeah, okay. So Evelyn, you got your number back. How do I, how am I gonna write that down? We have to figure this out together. Um, you could do four point. No, no, no. We don't need to put this in scientific notation because the number is not bigger than a million. Oh, right. We would just write it down. So what would you write down? Um, 4,285.7 um, centimeters prone. I was worried you gonna say that. Why'd you stop there? Why not keep the point one four two eight six? I mean, how many of these goddamn digits do we need? This is a question we're going to be asking ourselves. Let me tell you something, Evelyn. All these numbers, most of them don't mean jack diddly squat, okay? They're all lies. I want to keep the four, and I want to keep one more digit. So what should I round this to? Keep two digits. Uh, four, what? No point. No points. No points? Your, or, your number is of order 1,000. Uh, okay. 4,300? That's what I wanted to hear. And what are your units? Centimeters prime. Centimeters prime. Excellent. 4,300 fake centimeters. Hey, uh, how many meters is that? Four, uh, four. 430 or 43? Which one? 43. That's right. Because if I converted, watch my dimensional analysis, to convert from fake centimeters to fake meters, I would use the same conversion factor. One meter is 100 fake centimeters. One fake meter is 100 fake centimeters. That's 43 fake meters. Hey, how far away is 43 meters? Give me something that's 43 meters long. We gotta learn to think in terms of metrics. This is obviously way more fun if I do it in the classroom because I can take multiple meter sticks. Here's me. If I, geez. If I stack two meter sticks on top of each other here, I'm, I'm not quite two meters tall, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know. How many meters is a football field? I have no, I'm going to admit to you embarrassing thing. I have absolutely no knowledge of sports. I can't tell you the difference between a basketball and a soccer ball. I don't know who played on the Redskins, but how many meters is a football field? Someone's got to know out there. Joel, you're muted. So football field is 100, 100 yards, which is 300 feet, and then plus the end zones, which, is, which would be 120 yards, which is 360 feet. Okay, hold on. So 360 feet, I'm going to cheat. So, 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 so basically it's uh, – 100 40, meters. It's 40, like 100 meters. 40, 43 meters is 141 feet. So basically half, well, half a football field. Okay. So if you, thank you. Thanks for your uh, contributions there. Uh, if you made kids construct a paper mache sun, the size of this, this is about the size of a big beach ball. You'd have to send the kids half a football field away to play some marble earth. Okay. What about Pluto? How far would they have to go to Pluto? Can you guys think of a quick, is anyone out there enough, sh sharp enough in their toes? where they can think of a quick way to figure out the distance to Pluto in fake meters? Because I feel like we just did something there. 40, 40 times 43. Exactly. Joel, let me slow that down for a second. 
in a way, we just kind of constructed another conversion factor, didn't we? Because we've determined that one AU is the same thing as 43 fake meters. So if we did that, if we did what you said, dimensional analysis style, Joel, we would start with the disk. You know that Pluto is 40 AU away, right? That's what you right. in your mind. Yep. So we started with, to get to Pluto, 40 uh, AU. And then you put AU on the bottom and fake meters on top. Now, you, you weren't using dimensional analysis. You were using your brain, which is good, Joel. That's nice. But every now and then our brains fail, especially when it gets into more abstract units. So that's how I would have done it dimensional analysis wise. So what do you get, Joel, if you multiply 40 times 43? Uh, 1720, I believe. Let's round it to 1700 yeah. meters. How many kilometers is that? How many fake kilometers? Mm, let's see. 1700 times. Units on bottom? Meters. Units on top? You want to know kilometers or? Kilometers. Yeah. What's my conversion factor? <laughs> Shout out. Um, 1,000 meters equals one. Um, one kilometer. Where do I put the 1,000, Joel? On top. No, no, I'm on bottom. I'm bottom. Thank you. You almost made a mistake there. I was going to let you make that. That's an important mistake we just avoided. Sometimes the one goes on top. Sometimes it goes in the bottom. You got to follow the units, right, Joel? Yeah. Okay. So now tell me, how many fake kilometers is that? I'm 1. looking. 1.7. Thank you. Where are you? There you are. You're 1.7. Okay. To get to a Pluto, if I had a little BB that represented Pluto, those kids would have to go two kilometers. <laughs> but, wait, what's like two kilometers? Let's think, is that in our mind? How many miles is two kilometers? Just over one. Isn't it 1.6 kilometers to a mile? Yeah, something like, something like that. Let me just. <laughs> so they have to go a mile away. Yeah, to get to Pluto. <laughs> you basically send them like out of the schoolhouse and down to the, the, the creepy trailer park or whatever, you know, like <laughs> whatever you have to go to get. <laughs> and that's where they'd have to put their little BB. Okay, now, are we ready to have some minds blown here? Is it mind blowing time? That's crazy to think about. Oh, the Earth? Earth? With this example, Earth, Earth, Earth is half of is half a football field away, and Pluto's just over a mile away. Right, and Joel, it gets wow. even weirder than that. If you thought that was weird, I got I got some more news for you, uh, sir. Hold on a second. I just want to one point seven kilometers to miles. Um, yeah, exactly. It's pretty damn close to a mile. So. Uh, what if I wanted to send the kids to the nearest star? What's the closest star to the sun? Anyone know the name of our neighbor star? Science fiction fans, nerds like me, that read lots of sci-fi books, often know the nearest star to the sun just from, you know, from nerding out. Anyone mm -hmm. know what the Huh? Is the moon considered a star? No, definitely not. Our definition, our functional definition of star in this class will be ball with plasma. And the moon is not capable of self-sustaining nuclear fusion. It is not a star. The name of the right. star, it doesn't seem like anyone knows it. Ain't got no nerds in this class. I don't know how I feel about that. Okay, it's listen. Like Polaris something? Polaris is close, but it's not the closest. Polaris is the North Star. I'm going to talk about that eventually too, Evelyn. I'm going to try to teach you the names of some fun stars. The closest star to Earth is Alpha Centauri. It's actually a, well, I was going to say binary star system, but it's actually a trinary star system. But let's not blow your minds too hard right now. The closest star to the sun is Alpha Centauri A. And Alpha Centauri A happens to be the exact same mass as our sun, 
and also the same size as our son. And that's kind of convenient because if I wanted to have my kids in art class make a paper mache Alpha Centauri, we could make another beach ball the exact same size, cover it with the newspaper and the chicken wire. They could even paint it some flame colors or whatever. And then I'd have to say, okay, kids, you've got Earth, you've got Pluto. Now I want you to put Alpha Centauri into my scale model. Here's the problem though. When you start measuring the distances to stars, astronomical units, they won't do it anymore. We gotta work up to something bigger. Um, astronomers have invented another unit of length to deal with extremely long distances and it's called the light year. The light year is our next level up in terms of can I make a big ass ruler to measure things in space. They use the principle of light, which is the fastest moving thing in the universe. And they basically take their flashlight, they switch it on, they shoot the photons out into space, and they try to find out how far the photons will have traveled after one year. When there's more time, I actually have the students work that problem out, but I'm perilously close to completely out of time. So I'm just gonna tell you the solution here. Um, let's write this down as a quick definition so it's not total freaking chaos. Guys, keep all these notes because we're gonna need them. Okay. Uh, introducing the light year. The light year is a unit of distance, but it has the term year in it, so people sometimes confuse it with time. That's unfortunate. Try not to do that. The abbreviation for light year is 1ly, and it's defined, triple equals, the triple equals is for defined, as the distance light travels in one year. And in a future date, I might have us work this out as a sample problem, but for now, I'm going to tell you that the answer is one light year is 9.5 times 10 to the 12 kilometers. How do I say that in plain English again? Trillion. That's right. One light year is 9.5 trillion kilometers. Okay. Alpha Centauri the closest star to the sun is known as Alpha Centauri because it's located in the constellation uh, Centaurus. And Alpha Centauri is 4.4 light years away. Now, to wrap it all up, my final point, which is supposed to be a crescendo for this lecture, is the following question. How far do the little kids with their paper mache sun need to go to get to Alpha Centauri? 4.4 light years away. What's the technique that we're going to use to solve this problem? Jose, what's it called? Uh, analysis. Yes, look for the smiley analysis. Thing. Dimensional analysis. You got it, son. Okay, so um, how do I do it? Let's start with our steps to guide our logic, Jose. What's the first step? Write down the number to convert with its units. So Jose, what do you think that number is? Uh, would it be 4.4? Light years, but yes. Light years. Say the units too, okay. Yep. So the question we're answering is, how far in the scale model to Alpha Centauri? So Joel has correctly realized that we need to start with 4.4 light years. What is the second step in dimensional analysis, Joel? I'm sorry, I'm oh, sorry, Jose, I apologize. Uh, multiply by division bar. 
Okay, what's the third step, Jose? Third step is put units in first to cancel. All right, so let's see if we can figure this out. What units do I want to put on bottom? Always start with your bottom units first. Bottom units, um, kilometers? Well, here's the deal, Jose. This light year here is on the top. What you're supposed to put on the bottom is whatever you have here so that you can cancel out. Okay. If you put kilometers on the bottom, it's not going to cancel anything. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. So instead, we're going to put light years. All right. What do you want to convert your light years into? The top is the next question. By the way, let's cross these out right away. That's our motivation as a character. We're always going to cross out light years. What should I convert into up top? I, I left this question open-ended. I really, I didn't exactly say what units I wanted the answer in, but let's say I want them in, in fake kilometers. I'll, I'm assuming that the kids are gonna have to go some number of kilometers away. They had to go 1.7 kilometers to Pluto, right? So I'm assuming that since the star is farther than Pluto, fake kilometers would be my best answer. Will's looking at the cat for help here. He's like, do you understand any of this shit? <laughs> what do you think, uh, Jose? What should I convert my light years into? Uh, fake kilometers. That would only work if you knew how many light years equals how many fake kilometers. You do not mm. have that conversion factor. What do you mm. have a conversion factor of light years into? You have to leapfrog over the stones until you get to your final answer. Think of solving a problem like trying to get across a river by hopping on stones. What you just tried to do is hop the whole damn river. And I think the whole damn river is too wide because you don't have light years to fake kilometers. You have light years to real kilometers. Um. Am I losing yet or are you with me? Look at the yeah, I think, I, I think you lost me, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Let's get some help from our friends here. Anyone else with me? 9.5 times whoa, 10. Whoa, 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 hold on. Did I just hear someone say numbers? Who's talking numbers? Who's talking Joel. numbers? Who are you? I'm a friend. Joel. Joel, you are not allowed to touch a number until your units are in place. Shame on you. No one touches a number in this class until their units are in place, okay? No one speaks to Kilometers. me. Okay, who said that? Who are you? Me. Shay. Shay, yes. Yeah. Thank heavens to Betsy. Someone's speaking my language here. We're going to go to kilometers. Jose, not fake kilometers. This is why we have to have the primes, okay? We oh, know okay. into real kilometers. My markers are dying. Note to self, go to CVS after class, get some good markers. Okay. So, Jose, it's possible that you might have been extra confounded by the fact that I wanted the answer in kilometers prime, but we had a conversion factor to regular kilometers. This is the importance of having the prime so we don't confuse real units with paper mache units, all right? Okay. Wait, that was a trick question. I don't think so at all. <laughs> See, in my mind, I have a strong distinction between the real distance to Alpha Centauri and the distance in the paper mache model. And what helps me distinguish is the little prime. I am looking for kilometers prime. How far do the kids have to go? But I have a conversion factor to true kilometers. Do you see what I'm saying, Joel? No, oh, I know. Not tricky. Well, tricky, but not intentionally tricky. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so we gotta go back to step two. <laughs> Let's make this a free for all. Where do I go from here? Put kilometers on the bottom of the division bar. Right. And on the top? Uh, we got to get into some kind of prime units here. Uh, 
fake centimeters? Sure. And then what do we do? Let's keep going from there. And then fake centimeters on the bottom. And then fake kilometers on top. Do you know how many centimeters are in a kilometer? I'll let you do that if you can tell me right now how many centimeters are in a kilometer. Didn't think so. Do you know centimeters into any other unit? Meter. How many centimeters in a meter? 100. Good. So I'll let you go to fake meters next. Um, we need no one more. Now what do you do, Joel? Fake meters on the bottom. And then fake kilometers. Damn. This is how you set up a problem like a pro. Notice you didn't speak in any numbers really until we're all your units from place. Let's cross it out. Kilometers kill kilometers. Fake centimeters, fake centimeters, fake meters, fake meters. Okay, now we got to put all the numbers in. That can be tricky. Joel, walk me through it. Or anyone, I don't care who it is. I have, I have a question before we keep going. Is that okay? I would love to hear a question. Ask me anything. I don't understand, um, Joel, how he knew to put um, fake centimeters on top. I was going to say like um, fake kilometers, so I don't understand how he knows that. Well, probably, can, can I answer for Joel and then I'll let Joel answer for himself? I'm betting that Joel was just staring at the screen and looking up here at the original conversion factor. And I bet Joel said, well, I got kilometers there and I got fake centimeters there. That's what I was hoping. Is that what uh, happened, Joel? Or did you use some other inspiration? Yeah, so, so Shay, if you, if, if, if you follow it, like, like if you start at the beginning, light years is on, is on top because that, the 4.4 light years would be over one. And then when you multiply on the division bar, you have to do the inverse. And put but, light but hold on, Joe, I think that's a distraction. Flipping. Where the numbers go is a secondary point. We're just, what Shay's question is, how did you know which units to put in place? Yeah. And Joel, that's not a question of numbers. Oh, okay. Well, it, yeah, it, it's just the, the conversions and, 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 and the givens that we know. Right, because for instance, Shay might have been worried that the fact that we had also used that one AU is equal to 43 fake meters, right? And so there are a bunch of different conversion facts. In the past, some students have tried to go to AU first and I let them do that. But I wanted this to be a kind of choose your own adventure dimensional analysis problem. I suspect that what happened, although Joel your answer got a little sidetracky there, unfortunately, sir. You weren't, nothing you were saying was wrong. It just wasn't to the point of Shay's question. I suspect that what happened is he was just looking up here and said, well, there's some kilometers and there's some fake centimeters. So there's a conversion right there. So let's just do that. Um, okay, okay. We also could have used the fact that earlier we found that Pluto is 6 billion kilometers away and that's equal to 1.7 fake kilometers. We could have actually attacked it from any one of those three conversion factors, but this one made the most sense. Anyways, Joel, I know you love them numbers. Where are you, buddy? So why don't you help me slide those numbers in uh, uh, for the win, okay? So what numbers go here? Um, 9.5 times 10 to the 12th kilometers. Oh, kilometers. Is that right there. Yep. Okay. On the bottom? One. Okay, how about over here? Uh, on, on the bottom, 1.4 times 10 to the sixth. Okay. On the top, 40. Good. Next one? On the bottom, oh God. Centimeters to meters, centi. Oh, uh, one on top. 100 on the bottom. Yep. <clears throat> and last kilometers to meters. And then one on top and 1,000. Okay. Punch them up. That's your job. I don't need to punch them up because I'm teaching this class. You guys are my little punching machines, my, my computers as it will. So what we're going to do is I want you to punch it in like this. You're going to do 4.4 times 9.5 EXP 12 times 40 divided by 1.4 EXP 6 
divide by a hundred and divide by a thousand. And then we can do lab. 4.4 4 times 9.5 trillion times 40 divide by 1.4 million divide by 100 divide by 1,000. Round your answer to two significant figures. Sarah, you got something for me? I want to hear from all my little friends here. Uh, I'm still copying it down. All right, to copy it down. Any speed demons out there? 12,000. Hell yeah, who said that? I got one right. Where are you? Oh, my, Shay. Name, my name is Shay. Shay. Shay, okay, so I think you don't understand what's happening. Um, if I click to gallery mode, I can see all of you at once. But when I'm in speaker mode, it only shows me four of you at a time, but it has an arrow so I can kind of scroll through your faces. If someone off the little ribbon bar speaks, I've got to quickly click around to see who's talking. So, uh, yes. so yes. yeah. <laughs> hey, Shay got it right. She got 12,000. What are my units, Shay? Oh boy, uh, fake kilometers. Hell yeah. Hey, there's a problem with this though. Guys, the kids to get to Alpha Centauri, they would need to go 12,000 kilometers away. Do you know what the diameter of Earth is? It's 12,800 kilometers. Yay! <laughs> so if the kids started off here, with one beach ball in Rhode Island, they would probably have to put the next beach ball somewhere down here in the Philippines. We have to send the kids to the Philippines. So imagine a beach ball in Rhode Island and imagine a beach ball in the Philippines and that's the scale distance between the closest two stars Whoa. to the sun. That's pretty freaking nuts, right? Yeah. Do you think the sun is in danger of colliding with Alpha Centauri in the next billion years? It no. wasn't until you said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, it's like if you, you ever been, you know that CCRI parking lot? It's huge, right? You guys have to walk out to, I parked in G. That's what I hear the kids saying to me all the time. Imagine if you just put two people in the CCRI parking lot and you put blindfolds on them and you had them each roll like a tennis ball across the parking lot. I'd say the chances of those two tennis balls colliding with each other is probably pretty low because the lot is significantly bigger than the diameters of the two tennis balls. The chances of them kind of bumping into each other are quite slim. And this is also true with stars, that stars are pretty big compared to your pet chihuahua, but compared to the distances between the stars, star diameters are much less than their separations. For this reason, there do not exist any photographs of two stars colliding. Stars do not collide ever. Weirdly, however, Galaxies, although they are much further apart than stars, have really, really big diameters. And for this reason, galaxies sometimes do collide. And we have many uh, fascinating and wonderful pictures of this. This is what your first homework problem is going to be about next time. So I'd like to show you a picture of Stefan's quintet. Stefan's quintet is a pair of colliding galaxies. It's actually like an interaction between four galaxies, but two are clearly in collision. Uh, let's show them here. So here's an, ooh, actually, I kind of like this one. This one's clearly in the optical regime, which is, well, we'll talk about that later. Look at this beautiful image 
of a pair of colliding galaxies. I'd like to annotate this for you here. Um, all of these galaxies are probably interacting with each other, but you can see these two spiral galaxies are in a collision and their spiral arms are kind of merging together. The collision of two galaxies is kind of weird because it's kind of like a swarm of gnats colliding where the swarms can collide, but the individual stars don't collide because they pass through each other because the interparticle separation of the stars is much greater than the size of the stars themselves. So in a paradoxical way, galaxies can collide with each other, but the, the stars don't. It's very interesting how that works. Anyways, you've just taken your first step into a much larger world. Let's think about what happened. You learned a boring ass, little stupid technique called dimensional analysis. And with this, you discovered that you have what it takes to teach art class. And now you can also contemplate the difference between stellar collisions and galaxy collisions. Dimensional analysis is powerful and it can help you solve many complex problems. That's the first of many steps. Okay, oh my gosh, I went really over time here. We are gonna do a, guys, I did not realize what I was doing. I am gonna do a highly shortened version of today's lab. And today's lab is just gonna be practicing a few problems in scientific notation. Uh, although sometimes I'm a little bad at timekeeping, I am gonna really try to have us wrap up by four every day. That's a promise that I make to you. No matter how much I screw up or no matter what stupid things I do, I'm not gonna keep you late. If anything, I'm gonna even let you out early. Now these classes are long. They require a lot of attention span and I get it, but it's a summer class. I'm stuck doing it with you. Our lives are over on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next seven weeks, okay? Let's talk about how we transition to lab. I'm gonna take my computer over here and I'm gonna set it up on my desk. I think I'm gonna either open the window or turn the air conditioning because I'm, it's kind of warm out today, isn't it? Okay, let's talk about how lab works. Lab is supposed to be easy and fun. It's a little hands-on exercise on what we're about to do or on what we learned about during the day. Uh, to get started, Do you all have the laboratory handout that I provided for you? Cameron, I can't really see you, but I hope you're with us. Uh, same with Alba. Do you guys all have the lab handout that I provided on Blackboard? Uh, you do not, Catherine. Not printed. Okay. I can go print it out. Could you? You yeah. have a printer? Just hit print right now. Can you do it quickly? Uh, give me like two minutes. All right, go do it. Um, Alba, you're here. I can see that because you're typing to me. And by the way, the chat bar is really nice. Oh, and Cameron says I'm here too. The chat bar is helpful if you don't have a camera or an audio thing. Hi, hi, I'm here. Um, so you guys can hear me at least. Uh, do you guys, Alva and Cameron, have copies of this? because I need to figure out what we're doing. In an ideal world, everyone would just print it like uh, whoever that was. Oh, Catherine. <laughs> everyone would just print it like Catherine did and we'll do the work together and then we'll like, actually, we only need one page today because we're gonna do a much shorter version of the lab. This guy. We're just gonna do one page because I, I talked too long. Uh, Cameron, do you have this? Alba, do you have this? Or if you have it on your screen, you could try to use a text editor or uh, you could just simply write the problems down on a piece of paper and then write the answers out. That's what you're gonna have to do if you don't. Okay, Cameron, we need to talk. Can you hear me? Uh, wait, Alba. you're quiet, you're quiet, but I can hear you. Who's talking? Alba. Oh, hey Alba, what's up? Oh. So I don't have it printed. I could get it printed. Um, I'm just going to write it down on a piece of paper right now. All right. So for today, you will write it down and then just take a photo of that. Okay. Now, that Cameron good. texted me and said, I'm going to use the text editor, but I've got something to say to Cameron. He might know this because I think, Cameron, are you the same Cameron that was in my class like a semester ago? 
Are you that same camera or are you a new camera? Oh yeah, okay. So you know me, Cameron. Cameron knows that I care about text editors. Like if you're gonna put numbers in, do you see how my number looks? Oh, wait, you guys can't see my camera, hold on. Or my screen. Share screen. I do not wanna see you putting in scientific, <laughs> enable editing. I don't wanna see nobody punching in scientific notation like this, six times 10 carat six. I don't wanna see any of that shit. That looks like garbage, I don't wanna look at it. Cameron, if you're gonna use your text editor, you've gotta use an equation editor like a big boy, okay? So what you gotta do is you gotta go up here to insert, you've gotta do uh, equation to use your equation editor and your equations better look like this. One AU is equal to 150, it doesn't have to be in bold by the way, I'm just accidentally in bold, times, oh watch, here's how you do the, uh, you go up here to your scripts, you do a little power key. See what I'm doing, Cameron, how I'm making it look nice? That's, that's the way it's gonna look on your page. If you wanna use it in a text editor, Cameron, I'm cool with that, but you gotta use your equation editor to make it look pretty and make it look nice. You got, okay. So Cameron, you got that? Give me a, a yeah or something. Does everyone else understand what I'm saying? All right, let's get going. To do this, I'm gonna make use of a feature here. I'm gonna share my iPhone with you. And let's pray to Jeebus that it actually works. Because it didn't yesterday, hold on. Hopefully I won't get any, uh... embarrassing text messages, but that's always possible. I have a screen mirroring feature here, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. All right, it's having trouble. Meanwhile, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna reboot my phone. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna take my camera off. And share it with you like so. Can everyone see that okay? Just trying to get it focused. Okay. First thing I need you to do for me is your name. Under the name sheet, uh, Sorry, I'm trying to get my autofocus going here. Uh, the cell phone works much better than this. Whoever made the Apple iPhone figured out the autofocus much better than this stupid dumbass. All right, I, I need you to put your name at the top. That's important. I also need you to put your lab section as AS1020. Everyone got that? The purpose of today's lab is to practice just using our EXP key and to do some stuff in scientific notation. So let's start with our first problem here. Our first problem is 2.0 times 2.8 EX5. Do we all have calculators? Will, you're up. I want you to type into your calculator 2.0 times 2.8 exp5 and hit equals. What do you got? Uh, 56,000. Is it 56,000? Hold your calculator up to the screen there. It's also from the 80s. Oh, you got a yeah, 80, how... oh, just like mine, dude. Hold on, let me go to uh, full screen on you. Well, show me your number again, show me your number. Hold it up. Fuck, it's really blurry. 
a uh, little lower. Is that that's not fifty six thousand? Put put a comma after three zeros. Go ahead, look at it again. Look at your number again. Five hundred sixty thousand. All right, that's right. Now, normally you would not have to put that into scientific notation, but today you do. I want that in proper form. Can you do that for me? What do I write? Uh, we're gonna write uh, five. Oh my gosh. Keep the change. Um, and you have to put 10. a decimal point after. No, no, you have to put a decimal point after your lead digit and keep any numbers that are not zero. So what do you got? Uh, five point six uh, times, times 10. ten to the uh, four. Count four? better. Watch me now. Watch how I do it. I put my pencil there. One, yeah. two, three, four, and you moved the decimal point there, didn't you? Mm hmm So how many times so did you five. move it? Five. Five. That's great. All right, Cameron, that's fine. That's fine, Cameron. 5.6 times 10 to the 5. That's all I want to see in your answer key. Go ahead and write it down. Okay, so I'm just going to go. Uh, Shay, you're up, buddy. Okay, by the way, we need to have a quick chat here. Do you guys see this power of negative six? We're going to talk yep. about that. Hey, let me see if my iPhone works because it's, it's just a little bit nicer. I don't know why you have to reboot it sometimes, but you do. Huh. Yesterday I was using my iPhone for my camera and it, the screen mirroring was working and it suddenly stopped. And I meant to look into why it was after class and I'm gonna admit now that I totally forgot. And I think I might have to reboot my router or something. Guys, there's gonna be a lot of technical bullshit. It's part of the fun of this online class, so bear with me. All right, look over here. I can use negative powers to represent small numbers. Let's talk about really tiny numbers. Like let's talk about the number 0 0.000234. That is an irritating number. That's a number that I don't want to see written down on your paper, okay? Now, uh, one way that we can deal with this is by using powers of negative 10. I think I've got to get a new webcam. Believe it or not, webcams are hard to find right now, and I, I paid top dollar for this, and I'm kind of irritated about it. There we go. Um, 10 to the minus 1, you might have forgotten what this means, but in your math class, oh, come on. 10 to the minus 1 means 1 over 10 to the power of 1, okay? Or 1 tenth. One-tenth is a decimal looks like that, 0 0.01. 10 to the power of minus 2, that means 1 over 10 squared. 1 over 10 squared is a hundredth, and a hundredth as a decimal is 0 0.01, all right? 10 to the minus 3, take a guess what that is. It's 1 over 1,000 or a thousandth. 0 0.001. Every time you raise 10 to a negative power, you get a smaller and smaller number where the one occupies the fourth place over from the decimal point. Let's try to put two 0 0.000334 into scientific notation. Shay, what's your lead digit in this number? Two. All right, let's keep some change. Keep some 34 cents. Times 10 to what power? One, two, three, four, four, to the negative four. That's right. Sorry, I'm fiddling with this fucking camera. Ah, oh, it drives me crazy. To the minus four, right? Yep. Okay. 
Now, when we enter in negative powers on our calculator, we are going to use, we do not use the minus key. We are going to use the negative key, the plus minus key, okay? That's what we need. Does everyone see that? Can you identify the negative key on your calculator? Make sure you're not accidentally hitting minus or this is going to mess up. Okay, so Catherine, you're up. Okay, hold on. 5.6. Times 6.725 EXP minus 6. So I need you to punch that into your calculator. 5.6 times 6.725. Then you do EXP negative key 6 equals. What do you got? So I got... Hold on. Three point seven six six times ten to the negative three. Three point seven six six times ten to the wait, minus three. How'd you get minus three? Oh wait, hold on. Five. It's five. Sorry. I yeah. counted the wrong way. <laughs> That's good. That's why we're practicing, right, Catherine? Yes. Uh, Evelyn, I'm trying to get this focused for you, buddy. Just bear with me here. It's like if I put it somewhere, it, it focuses and then it loses it. Okay. <coughs> Your next problem is 3.77 <coughs> times 10 to the 5 times 4.8 EXP3. Did you punch that in? Um, three point. Does like order of operations matter at all? Like, no. In or, fact, one of the reasons, Evelyn, that you're using your double E key is because it glues this number and that number together, so that you don't end up with order of operation issues. So, oh, since good. you mentioned to order of operations, the double E key is helping us. It keeps the scientific notation as a single number. So on yours, you would punch 3.77 double E5 times 4.8 double E3. Okay. And what do you got? One trillion? Trillion? <coughs> Let's just put Eight. it in scientific notation. Okay. Your lead digit's uh, one. <clears throat> um, 1.8 times 10 to the one. I like how you rounded boldly. That's good. To the ninth. Very good. And once again, let's just watch how she did that there. That was 3.77 EXP5 times 4.8 EXP3 equals. That's the number that she got. Sorry about the autofocus, my stupid ass phone. If I reset my browser, I'm going to lose you guys. So I can't do that. And then she counted her from her decimal point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I just wanted to show everyone how, how Evelyn did that. Okay, uh, Joel, you're up next. 5.29 EXP3 times 6.8 EXP minus 7. What you got? Everyone should be punching, by the way. If we were in a real lab together, I would walk around and torture all of you. It's harder for me to get to you physically. Uh, so I got 3.5972 times 10 to the negative third. That's correct. But why don't we round it? What do you want to round this to, uh, Joel? Make, just kind of use your imagination there. What do you? Uh, 3.6. I love it. So 3.6 times 10 to the minus 3.
Put a box around it because that's a classy move. Okay. Now we'll move on to section two. Who's next in my list of torture victims? Laura, 9.65 EXP3 divided by 2.0. 4,900. Can we round like that or no? Um, six, five. I'm going to talk about rounding in a second. I'm sorry, what did you get? 4,825. Okay, let's put that in scientific notation. Sorry. 4.8 times 10 to the 3. I like it. And now I'm going to box that. Because that's a classy move. Jose, you're next on my list. I want to try 5.6 EXP5 divided by 1.6 EXP5. 5.6 Oh, that's a lot of zeros. Um, uh, wait, hold on. That's not what I get. Watch. Hold on. Watch I think I typed it, in, typed it in wrong. Yeah, I would do 5.6 EXP5. Mm -hmm. you have to hit, do you have an EXP key? Uh, yeah, I have the, the PCALC light up. Oh, I think that one's just uh, E, right? Let me look at my PCALC app. You oh, are the EXP. I have the XP, yeah. So on yours, you'd be typing um, 5.6, oops, EXP5, right? Mm -hmm. Divide by, sometimes mm -hmm. it's easy to hit the wrong buttons on a phone calculator. That's why I don't like them. 1.6 EXP5. That's what I get. Oh, okay. Because I divided it before um, without putting the EXP, so I just typed it in wrong. I got like 350 with like 100 zeros on them. Right. Something so you completely gotta, different. I th you maybe were hitting equals every time. I don't know. Did you see how I did it? Can you just try it my way? Yeah. All right. So what's my final answer in scientific notation? All right. I just, I just want to type it out again just to make sure I have it correct. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a fantastic idea. Well, I got it. I got my stupid iPhone to work. Thank God. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. The focus issue shouldn't be as bad now because the iPhone is a bit nicer. Okay, so, oh, I guess I can show you my screen, can't I? Did you get it this time, dude? Uh, no, I'm just missing the, the second number to divide it by. Um, okay, hold on. Okay, so. What'd you get? Yep, I got the I got the same three point five. Okay, that's fine, but for the purposes of this exercise, everything needs to be in scientific notation. So how do I put the number three point five in scientific notation? So it'd be three point five times ten. It's always gotta be times ten. Times ten. What power though? Hmm. Would it be to the power of one? Uh, well, if you did that, 10 to the power of one is 10. 3.5 hmm. times 10 is 35, but you don't have 35. 
You, how many times did you move the decimal point? That's right, Joel. How many times did you move the decimal point? Uh, uh, well, where are you? Jose. Jose. Yep. Uh, none. So what's your power then? Zero. That's my boy. And remember, 10 to the zero means one, right? Yep. So 3.5 times one is 3.5. That's a good trick, uh, Jose. Anytime you want to just put a number to scientific notation, if you just multiply times into the zero, you can leave the decimal point where it is. Okay. Um, I think, Joseph, you're next. Uh, Joseph, can you handle uh, 3.2 times 10 to the nine divided by 2.4 times 10 to the five? You got a calculator? Yeah, I just, I did it. I got one, like if I rounded, I think I did 1.3 times 10 to the fourth. So 3.2 EXP9. Yes, I like what you said, divided by 2.4 EXP5. Uh, and Joseph, I want to deal with rounding in just a second, but your, your, your suggestion was 1.3 times 10 to the fourth, and I love that. So let's do that. Now, part of today's lab is twofold. Part of today's lab is just learning how to put numbers in scientific notation and me kind of going around the room, quote unquote, making sure that you guys can handle punching these numbers and using your EXP key. But although I don't have a ton of time left with you guys, there's a chance for us to learn something else and to have a bigger message about this, about this lab today. And one of those messages could be about rounding and precision and trying to understand how do I know how many significant figures to keep? Now in our class, when you don't know what you're doing, a good rule of thumb is just to keep two significant figures and your power of 10 and call it good. But there is an art or a logic to knowing how many um, significant figures to keep. So significant figures are how many digits in your number are meaningful to the measurement. Let's say for instance, oh, sorry, that's an animated GIF. <laughs> Not what I was trying to find, okay, fuck. Phone. Okay. Uh, let's say, for instance, uh, am I frozen here? Okay. Let's say I wanted to take a measurement of myself, and I wanted to use these here meter sticks to do it, right? So you guys can see that a meter stick is graded in centimeters and millimeters. Millimeters are a tenth of a centimeter. And a meter stick goes up to about 100 centimeters here. Uh, a typical person is about two meters tall. So I need two meter sticks to measure my height. This isn't great, but F and A. I'm in my damn apartment, you know. So I'll hold these two meter sticks up. And <clears throat> when you do a good workman-like job in measurement, measurements in art form, you often want to specify the tolerance of your measurement. And that means how carefully a measure, how carefully am I taking my measurement and to what quality or care do I want that measurement to be taken? Now, if I did a sloppy job, like a college kid, I don't give a shit about anything, uh, what the hell, I could say uh, I'm about 180 centimeters tall and call it a day, but that's not doing a good workman-like job that takes my ruler to the limit of its precision. If I wanted to do that, I might specify a tolerance of hey dude, could you measure yourself to the nearest millimeter or to the nearest tenth of a centimeter? In that case, I'd put the two meter sticks up, put my earth marble over there, and I'd put the ruler across my head like so, okay? And I would try to measure myself to the nearest tick mark. And when I do that, I get 177.3 centimeters. Now, just bear with me here, I'm trying to explain a thing, okay? All numbers ultimately are measurements. And the measurement that I just took is I measured my height and I got 177.3 centimeters. Any person who comes along afterwards and looks at this number will intrinsically know something about the care or the quality to which this measurement was taken. A machinist would call it a tolerance. A scientist might call it the precision of the measurement. And oftentimes it's specified in a couple of different ways. 
sometimes they'll specify it as plus or minus the nearest tenth of a centimeter. And that means my measurement was good to the nearest tenth of a centimeter, to the nearest little tick mark. And you can kind of see that in my measurement here because each of these numbers conveys meaning about how tall that I am. The 100 centimeters means I'm taller than a munchkin. 177, 170 centimeters tells you that I'm not quite two feet. Uh, 177 says I'm almost 180, but three centimeters short. And this point three, that means that if I was really measuring myself careful, I'm at 100, and, sorry, 177, but I took the time to measure myself to three, sorry, to three more little tick marks. One, two, three. I measured myself to the nearest tenth of a centimeter, and I did a good workmanlike job. Um, we could also say about the precision that this number has four significant figures because each of the numbers here means something. The one, the seven, the seven, and the three. Another way of looking at precision, a physicist's way, is to say that this number has a precision of one part in a thousand. That means it's good to one part in a thousand. Because if you measure to a dime out of a hundred bucks, that's the same quality as measuring to a dollar out of a thousand bucks. In other words, the magnitude of your number also matters as part of the precision. If I measure the length of an ant and I find that the ant is five millimeters long, that's not very impressive. But when I measure myself and I find that I am 1,773 millimeters long, that's more impressive because I'm measuring to a millimeter out of a thousand. Do you see what I mean? A millimeter means more to my height than a millimeter means to an ant's height. If an ant is five millimeters long, if you fuck up the measurement by one millimeter, you're off by one part in five or a 20% error. If I screw up my measurement by one millimeter, I'm off by one part in a thousand, which is not a big deal. Does, do you understand why the magnitude number matters as well? Okay, so these measurements, one part in a thousand, are so sensitive that if I measured myself again, a small amount of error in the procedure might mean that I get different numbers. So for instance, what would happen if I measured my height and I got three different measurements? Each time the number came out a little different. Now, normally I demonstrate this, but I'm sort of running out of time. So I got to make quick work of the business here. Uh, suppose I did 177.3 centimeters, 177.2 centimeters, and I also got um, 177.5 centimeters. Which number of these, which measurement is the truth about my height? Each one of these was a valid measurement taken by me, and therefore each of these numbers is a valid representation of my height. Probably the smartest thing to do would be to take the average of these three and divide it by three. So let's try to do that, shall we? 177.3 plus 177.2 plus 177.5 equals divided by three. And look what I get there. Now, if you go and write this number down on your page, because you're a good little robot that does what the calculator tells you to do, then you are a fool who doesn't understand anything about measurement or which numbers are real and which numbers are fake. The fact of the matter is, you only took the time to measure yourself to the nearest tenth of a centimeter or the nearest millimeter precision. Do you see all those threes? Those are garbage threes. Those threes are fake. They're not real. They don't have anything to do with reality. Just because you divide by three doesn't mean you know how tall you are to a hundredth, a thousandth, a ten thousandth of a centimeter. That means you should probably round your answer to 177.3 centimeters, to be honest. Looks like my first measurement was the good one. As Sade says, it's never as good as the first time, okay? Now, anyways, um, what's the point that I'm trying to make? In scientific notation, the significant figures or the precision is contained here. So I was talking earlier, who was I talking to? I was talking to Joseph. 
Joseph, I got a question for you. How many significant figures does the top number have? Two. How many does the bottom have? Two. Exactly. And how many did you keep in your answer? Two. You did right. You kept the same number of sig figs coming out as you had going into your problem. In computer science, they have a phrase for this, and it goes, garbage in equals garbage out. The quality of your output is limited by the quality of the input. Okay, for our final active lab and class today, Sarah Darcy, you're gonna help me do this last one. Let's all punch it in in all of its hideousness. 2.99792 exp8 divide by 5.520 exp minus seven. And when I punch it, that's the nonsense that I get. Is that what you have on your calculator, Sarah? Sarah? Yes. Oh, so I didn't hear you because I opened a window and there's gangbangers outside playing loud music. Okay. <laughs> Just, <laughs> all right. Anyways. Um, uh, so, Sarah, how many sig figs do you have in your top number? Six. That's right. The two, the nine, the nine, the seven, the nine, the two are all significant figures. How many do you have in your bottom number? Uh, three. Sarah, in, when you put numbers into scientific notation, this zero counts. Let's do a quick thing here. Sarah, this number, 200, has one significant figure, okay? Just the two. The number 220 has two significant figures. The number 222 has three significant figures. The number 202 has three significant figures. That's weird. Hey, check this one out, Sarah. You're going to love this one. Guess how many sig figs that number has? Four. That's right. How many significant figures does this number have? Um, I'm going to guess six. That's correct. When the zero is on this side of the decimal point, it counts. Oh, let's try one more. How many sig figs? Uh, one. Very good. You are good. I like your style, kid. OK. How many are in the bottom number? Three. I have four. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. How many do you get to keep in your output? Um, four. That's right. Your output is limited by the crappiest number going in. So what should we round this to if we're going to be honest, Sarah? Um, 5.431 times 10 to the 14th. Damn, you're good. I like it. Nicely done. Don't forget to box your answers, class, because that's a classy move. How are we looking? Are we looking good? Guess what time it is? 3.56. I finished with four minutes to spare. <laughs> I told you no lies, right? Well done. Yeah. Hey, listen, guys. Um, you know how some people are good with things like kids and dogs and other people are good with things like taxes? Something I'm not good at is time. I have a fundamental, and I'm working on it every day, okay? I'm working on making sure we log in roughly on time, but I'll always make sure we finish on time. I was so excited to make my point about Alpha Centauri that I yapped a little longer than I should have in lecture. But it being the first day, I kind of had extra stuff on my plate, you know, because I had to talk about the class. With time, this should become a smoother operation. In any case, we finished by four. Now, show of hands. Does everyone have all those problems done? Did I, did I lose everyone? I tried to call on each one of you. Sorry, Cameron and Alba. Uh, okay, Alba's got her thumbs up. Hey, Cameron, you want to give me a little thumbs up here? There's a little thumbs up button. Or you can, if you can't, show me your real thumbs up. That's my clap. It's my thumb. Cameron, I'm, oh, 
Cameron, give me a thumb. Okay, cool. All right. Now, the rest of you guys that I can see, you got it too? Are we all done? Yeah. Okay. Real thumbs. I like them. Awesome. Now, let's try before we end our lab today, I want you guys to see what it looks like on my end when you submit something. So what you would do is you just take a picture, take a picture of your paper, and then let's see if we can upload it to lab one, and then we're done with our work for the day. Uh, you can probably upload it from your phone. You can, if you have a scanner and you want to scan, do that. Uh, whatever you got, just send it to me so I can give you some points. And uh, let's share screen. We are going to go over to Blackboard. And I think it only takes seconds to upload it. So could you guys let me know when you've uploaded? I just want you to see what one of the submission looked like. I'll have to go over to um, my grade center here. Hey, looks like Evelyn got hers up. Evelyn, where are you? Let's see what yours looks like, okay? Uh, we'll click grade all users. And do you see how Evelyn's little box here show? Oh, wow, look at that, that's wonderful. So Evelyn's shows right up there. And Evelyn, the fact that I can see it here means you can probably see it. So I can grade you and I'm gonna give you 10 out of 10, okay? Yay. Um, everyone else, I wanted Evelyn to show us that. So you should see yours too. If you can't see your problem set there, I may not be able to see your problem set, okay? Although technically that was a lab. Let's see how Cam's looks. I know some of you are familiar with Blackboard, but not everybody is. Uh, oops, sorry, that's Evelyn again. Uh, can I go to the next one? I don't actually want to grade yours yet because I want to keep track of this in my own personal logbook. So uh, let me go to the next one. Uh, here's Cam's. Cam, if you're going to write this stuff out in the future, I want you to write out the problems so I can follow along. Cameron, in the interest of time, I'm gonna let this slide today. But in the future, did you see how Evelyn wrote out the problems? That's what I want from you, buddy, okay? And that's a good point that I can make to the whole class. Does everyone hear me on this? If you're writing stuff out, you have extra work to do. You gotta write down the problems so I can see the whole thing. Cameron, it just looks a bit nicer and I can follow the work that you're doing better. I don't wanna to have to do research. Okay, so Cameron, you can submit this today and I'll give you your 10 points, but in the future, you write out the questions too. Okay, let's check out the next person. Here's Catherine, so let's see. All right, Catherine, this is the kind of shit I don't like. For some reason, um, and we gotta talk about this because this is what makes my life hell, and I in turn will make your life hell. Oh. I don't know why, but yours is coming up as a bloody hyperlink. Now, when I click this, I leave Blackboard. Now, that's cool, but I don't know why it's doing that. Do you know, is this a JPEG? Why is it doing that? I, like, changed my settings when you told us to at the beginning of class. Did you change it to most compatible? Let me double check, but I think so. But it, it should, you should actually be able to upload the photo. Like, I, I don't understand why this is happening. You know what? Yeah. It's changed, but I don't know. What's why. it changed to? Can you like show me on your screen or? Hold it on. Most let me, let me, hold on. I need to speaker view you. Hold on a sec. Hopefully you don't get any funny text messages here. Uh, oh, it says high efficiency. Oh, what's the other one? Oh, most compatible. Good. No, if you, that's good. So, hey, guess what? Uh, Catherine, yeah. you did good, and you need to keep it on most compatible. Otherwise, I would have gotten an HEIC file, and that would have been even worse. So you'll okay. notice that I, I'm being a little bit of a, a snit here, okay? I'm being a little bit of a complainer. Honestly, I could see your homework if I click on this, but why it's frustrating when that happens with like a 30 people is every time you leave Blackboard, Blackboard starts to glitch. So it's scary every time I have to click to a new link. So today I'm going to accept that because I could click on it and see it and I could go back. But in the future, can you try to figure out how some people when they do it just 
the, the picture actually loads like a picture. There's a little box feature. Now, why did it work for some and not for you? I don't know. Because I am i can't simultaneously see what all of you are doing. You know what I mean? But try to figure that out if you can. Okay. If not, I can at least handle this. Let's see someone else's. Uh, did, let me go back to my grading center. Okay, a few more of you have, have put stuff up here. Oh, Joel. Oh, there, that's you, Joel. Uh, let's... Uh, I'm just taking a minute, guys, to make sure we don't have any problems. Remember, your grade depends upon this. So unfortunately, it goes back to the first person. Blackboard's really clunky. Sometimes it doesn't like load things. It can be very confusing. Laura, oh, wow. Laura's is great. It loads right up. That's cool. Um, Shay, Shay, you got the damn image thing, but okay, that's fine. I can see it. But see if you can figure out how they did it. I wanted you guys to see what it looks like from my end so you know what I'm dealing with. I think that will yeah. help us both. Um, let's try the next person, Joseph DeGallo. Joseph, this looks awesome. So whatever you did, that worked, okay. Um, let's see who else has got stuff up for me. Joel, yours is loading in the box. That's damn fine. You wrote the numbers down, we're cool. I like all that, Joel, that's great. Okay, anything else? Okay, so that was nice because by showing you a few student submissions, you see when it looks good for me and when it looks bad for me. Catherine and Shay, it's all right. I could still click on the JPEG, but see if you can figure out how to make it load in the box, all right? Okay. Uh, the rest of you, I hope, my theory is this. I bet they give you a little preview of the box. If you don't see your picture in the preview, I'm betting that I can't see your picture. That's what I'm guessing. Please, no one forget to upload your lab. I don't want to start seeing zeros. Zeros are bad. They lead to the dark times. One last thing before we end. We know that we got more to do next class, right? We got to do a homework as well. These are going to be long ass days. Pack a lunch, okay? <laughs> uh, we're all going to try to, some days when the, when the homework is short, we might be able to skimp and meet at 10.30. But I think for our first homework session, we should meet at 10 o'clock. Does that sound good? All right. We're going to do our homework together. We'll have another lecture. We'll do our lab together, just like we did today. I don't have the homework in the next lab up yet, but I will do that by Thursday's class, OK? All right. Thank you for being with me and for putting up with all this madness. Um, I'll grade your papers. I'll see you guys Thursday at 10 a.m. Oh, one last thought. These videos will be uploaded, for those of you who may miss a class someday, to my YouTube account. If we go to Chrome, my YouTube is Brendan Britton. I think there's a couple of different Brendan Brittons. Let's try to search for me. My internet's running slow because I'm taxing it here. Sorry, guys. All right. If we type Brennan Britton, I think I, I'm sort of coming up here, OK? I've got 11 subscribers. Holy shit. Pretty soon they're going to start charging revenue. OK, so. Uh, <laughs> Not popular, but uh, I uploaded my first lecture from yesterday. Oh, and so right. you can go and you can watch these lectures and the labs. Now, for those of you who are with me in spring, okay, I used to load the lectures and the labs separate. That was a lot of work. I'm not going to be doing that anymore. I'm just going to upload one video, lecture and lab as a single video. We'll call it lecture one, lab one. Thursdays will be homework one, uh, sorry, homework one, lecture two, lab two. Does that make sense? If anyone ever misses the intro or misses a little part, if you need to go back, if you have a doctor's appointment, those will be there for you. But don't be a slacker because remember, the next class is on Thursday. So in theory, if you had missed today, you'd only have 24 hours to get all your shit together before the next class hits you. So we should probably just show up live and do it this way. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. 
thanks a lot. I'm stopping the recording. Uh, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Oh, uh, Alba. Yeah, before we go, Alba, let's let's check on you too. Uh, I don't mind just taking a second of my life to do that here. He's grading. Alba, I see yours. Um, I don't know how to go. Oh, here we go. Alba, you've got the same JPEG thing, but if I click on it, I can see it. Alba, it works, okay? It works, fine. As long as I can see it, that's fine. I just don't want any zip files. No zip files, nothing weird. Okay, uh, guys, so I guess I'll end the session now and I'll see you on Thursday. Sound like a plan? Okie doke. Take uh, care of yourselves. Bye. Bye.